All right, so any questions from the last time we met? <clears throat> Nothing at all. Now, this is a topic I'm a little shaky on. It's <laughs> a very bad joke. Um, <laughs> what is Parkinson's? Anyone know? Have you guys covered it with uh, Professor Kaplan yet? Lack of dopamine. What does that mean for us? For lacking dopamine. It's hard to initiate movement, right? So that's kind of the big thing you're going to find. Has anyone seen that movie called Awakenings? Probably from the 80s, maybe like early 90s. Things like Robin Williams and uh, Robert De Niro's in it. They basically work, uh, he's a, Robin Williams is a doctor. He works in this unit that has a lot of patients with Parkinson's disease. It's really actually really interesting to watch it because um, it's starting, it's like kind of the story of like the first therapy that we have with levodopa for, uh, for Parkinson's disease. And it's really kind of interesting watching these patients with total lack of dopamine going from basically a pure catatonic state where they basically could not communicate with the outside world, couldn't really do anything, um, to getting almost near full function back and then kind of that eventual degradation back to their, their baseline. It's a good movie if you want to check it out. But um, anyway, so basically what we're finding is it's a neurodegenerative disorder where you're losing these dopaminergic neurons, which is going to lead to, one, we're going to see tremor, which we'll talk about why that is in a moment. Uh, there's rigidity, hypokinesia, and some of this postural instability here, right? So again, it's very kind of um, obvious when you see someone with Parkinson's, they usually have that resting tremor, and they have that kind of that, um, uh, that certain gait that they have uh, due to that hard time really initiating movement. And so how do you think we're going to treat this disease from a medication standpoint? Give them more dopamine, right? We're going to give them something to help replace that dopamine that they're missing. We're going to find there's several ways that we can do that, but that's basically what we're going to be shooting for here, right? Um, now, interestingly enough, there's actually some ways that we can do this from a uh, drug standpoint. You actually can induce Parkinsonism in a patient. We talked about one a few lectures ago. What was that? Remember any dopamine receptor blocking agents? Or antipsychotic drugs. Remember, we talked about, uh, especially the first generation typical antipsychotics. Think about things like haloperidol and flufenazine. Those are the high potency dopamine 2 receptor blockers. They could actually induce that Parkinsonism, right? Uh, remember what I talked about with the, the patients who came in, they thought they were uh, taking street value, but they ended up getting haloperidol instead. How do they present? A dystonic reaction. They couldn't move basically because they had that dopamine receptor blockade. They couldn't initiate any further movements. So, the same thing here, which is basically what you're seeing here is basically this, the neurons are degenerating to the point where they're kind of having the same thing feature here. There's actually a really interesting uh, story about uh, the, it's called, I think it's like the, there's a case report called like the frozen drug addict. Uh, but basically it's this guy who was trying to make his own street Demerol. Demerol is an opioid uh, that was a little bit more popular back in the days. Uh, but he was trying to make, you know, his own kind of designer version of it. And you guys have all taken organic, organic chemistry and did all of your experiments go really well? No, mine, mine went pretty terrible. I had to convince the teacher to do it for me, basically, um, to my winning smile. Um, <laughs> they went terrible. So imagine if you're a street chemist, maybe you had no background, um, you know, things could go wrong. What's interesting is they actually developed this drug that's able to actually burn out all of his dopaminergic neurons. So when the people, you know, someone probably did a well call or something like that, went to his house, they found him in this catatonic state, and they're like, what in the heck happened here? You know, relatively otherwise healthy guy, and they actually found that he had burned out these dopaminergic neurons with this designer drug. So, not letting things go to waste, we actually now use that substance to induce Parkinson's-like states in lab animals, so that way we have a model that we can use to see how things like drug therapy is going to work and other things like that. So, you know, there's some good to be brought about from some of these kind of tragic events there. Anywho, that's that MT, uh, MPTP, if you ever get a chance to check that out. Um, it's kind of an interesting uh, story. Um, so anyway, looking at uh, the two different types of dopamine neurons we're going to be focusing on here, or receptors, I should say, there's the D1 and D2. D1 tends to be more stimulatory. D2 tends to be inhibitory. Um, and again, what you're going to find is that substantia nigra is going to be containing those projections and that will uh, synapse in the striatum. That's what's responsible for a lot of those movement patterns we talked about way back in physiology. You guys remember that? Way back in the summer. Seems like such a long time ago when you guys are more innocent, naive, and you've learned the harsh realities of the world. Anyway, what's happening here, is, and, and again, I'm not going to get too in the weeds here as far as the, the actual pathophysiology goes, because basically what we need to know is there's a lack of dopaminergic activity here. What's ultimately happening here in the normal state is there's going to be a balance here between the D1 and the D2 receptor activity. You're going to find that typically there's a good balance between the stimulation and the inhibition. So that way when eventual signals get down to the thalamus, they can then transmit signals to the motor cortex. And we know that the motor cortex does what? 
you know, it's movement, right? We talked about how the substantia nigra is helpful with, um, you know, those complex sort of motor patterns. Well, all that signal has to get transferred over here. And there's a lot of stimulatory and inhibitory interneurons that are playing a role here. So, for instance, things that are releasing these GABAergic, or uh, what do you think is being released from GABAergic neurons? GABA, and GABA does what? Inhibits things, right? So, again, in which you can actually find if you inhibit a stimulatory neuron that's releasing glutamate, ultimately that has an overall inhibitory sort of feature there, right? So again, if I'm not releasing enough glutamate, that's going to overall be inhibitory. That's kind of what's happening here when you're getting into the actual uh, patient with Parkinson's. What you find is they're lacking that dopamine. And so you end up finding that you're going to have a lot more stimulation on these inhibitory pathways, which eventually leads to ultimately an inhibitory pathway to the motor cortex. That's basically making it more difficult for the patient to initiate the movement. They may have the thought process to start the movement, but the neurons there are not working effectively. And ultimately, you're going to get this overall inhibitory sort of effect on the thalamus, and then eventually no signals make it to the motor cortex. Yes, sir? So I haven't like slept in weeks, so I've been trying to figure out what dopamine does. Cool. So dopamine inhibits GABA stuff, which allows us to move. Not always, right? <laughs> It, it, it's always the, the answer is that it depends, right? So, for instance, here, if you look at the, we said these dopamine 1 tends to be stimulatory, right? So, normally, what you find a D1 would stimulate this neuron here that would release GABA, but if we lose that dopamine, there's less GABA activity, right? Okay, so it's one thing. Um, and again, this is a GABAergic neuron releasing onto a GABAergic neuron. So, if I have the inhibitory neuron stopping the function, that's not going to inhibit that other inhibitory neuron, which ultimately means it's going to be more active which means you're going to have an overall more inhibitory sort of effect on the thalamus, so right? That would be muscle relaxation. It would make it so that it can't initiate the movement necessarily. It's not necessarily relaxation. It's just I can't initiate my brain saying, hey, make this movement pattern happen, but it's not ever making it to the motor cortex to eventually make it down to the skeletal muscles, essentially, right? Here, on this other factor here, if we lose this inhibitory feature, because you said D2 is inhibitory, if you're losing activity there, this means that these gabinergic neurons are going to be more likely to fire off. There's going to be more overall excitatory activity in these neurons, and that's, that's going to lead to this one having more inhibition on it, which means it's not going to be releasing much GABA, which means the glutamate is going to be a little bit more active, which means that I'm stimulating this gabinergic neuron which overall is going to increase activity and cause inhibition. It gets very complicated, right? Which is why I didn't want to get too much into the weeds overall. Just know kind of what's going on at the beginning and then what's happening at the end here, right? It's like stuff goes in, stuff goes out. I don't know what happens in the middle, but I just know what happens at the end. So like in Parkinson's, D1 is stimulated and D2, like there's not as much of that? Both of them tend to be under-stimulated, right? Because again, the dopaminergic neurons are frying out. They're not releasing as much dopamine. GABA. From this standpoint, from this particular neuron here, there would be less GABA being released. But down the line, when you get into something like um, uh, the globus pallidus, what you're finding is that you're getting overall too much GABA activity here onto the thalamus because of both a lack of D1 activity and relative lack of D2 activity, right? So again, it gets complicated. And again, if you talk to someone who's like a Parkinson's expert, they could probably give you a much more either in-depth or maybe like the explain it like I'm five kind of uh, thing here. Basically, what I'm trying to get at is that you're having a lack of dopamine activity, thus you're having a lack of signal being sent to that motor cortex, you have a lack of movement. And what we're going to find with the drugs is that basically what we need to know is we're going to increase dopamine activity, which means you're going to have more stimulatory activity on the motor cortex, which means you're going to have that movement occur. Okay. So we can get someone from a relatively catatonic sort of state where they can't initiate any movements to then be able to walk around and have be able to perform some activities of daily living, right? So again, don't get too worried about this aspect here. Just know basically what's happening at the beginning and overall what the effect is at the end. Okay. So other things to consider here as well. Um, notice that there's a, a seesaw sort of activity here between acetylcholine and dopamine. We talked about this a little bit when we were talking about the antipsychotics. And similarly, there's that same sort of um, seesaw effect with prolactin and dopamine as well, where you have less dopamine activity, you're gonna have more acetylcholine activity and more prolactin activity here. What you find is that when you have this increased acetylcholine activity, this is what's gonna actually be causing a lot of the resting tremor that occurs, right? Because you think tremor, that's movement, but that's not really an intentional movement that the brain's saying, I want to make this movement pattern happen. It's a tremor at rest is what you're seeing. And a lot of it is due to that acetylcholine. And we're gonna find their specific therapies are gonna be good for treating that particular uh, set of adverse effects from the disease versus actually treating the lack of dopamine as well. So we're gonna see there's kind of two different mentalities we'll go with, different drugs we're gonna use for those symptoms. Okay, here is a dopaminergic neuron. So here's the process for how we actually generate dopamine 
in the CNS. Basically, you're going to put in some sort of precursor. You can have things like L-DOPA come in here. This is where we're actually going to be supplementing that with our drug therapy. But you have other things like phenylalanine, L-tyrosine. Remember tyramine? We talked about tyramine being a problem with things like monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Tyramine also factors in here as well. Those are precursors to our catecholamines like dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, etc. Right? So basically what's going on is you're going to have these precursors come in. They're going to get converted over. There's going to be a couple of enzymes that we're going to be focused on their activity, right? So there's two enzymes, COM-T, which stands for catecholamine O-methyltransferase, which you find that down there in the, in the legend. Uh, and there's going to be monoamine oxidase B. Remember we talked about with the monoamine oxidase inhibitors before, they were non-selective for A or B. The ones we're talking about today are selective for B. So COM-T normally is going to take the L-DOPA and then degrade it down into a metabolite where it can get, get lost, right? We don't really care about that so much. What would happen if I inhibited COM-T? You'd have more L-DOPA. Okay, so if I inhibit COM-T, you have more L-DOPA. That's one way we're going to be able to target this, this pathophysiology, right? Again, what you're going to find is it's going to be sort of a, a gradual path. You don't just all of a sudden lose all of your dopaminergic neurons in one day. It's going to be a gradual sort of thing where you're going to try to hold on to as much of that activity as you can. And we're going to find that if we can try to be uh, as, as efficient with the dopamine that our brains are producing anyway, that's going to be beneficial, right? So anyway, COM-T is one way we can uh, affect the system. Next, you're going to find that dopamine is initially formed here. So DA stands for dopamine. And then we find that is normally broken down by monoamine oxidase B. It's the one we're going to mainly be focused on here. So what would happen if I inhibited monoamine oxidase B? More dopamine, right? And that's, again, fixing our main problems of the lack of dopamine. Once that's formed here, it's going to be able to be released from these vesicles into the synaptic cleft and have be able to initiate that movement there, right? Um, we're going to have dopamine transporters. We're going to have autoreceptors. Don't get too lost in that. But the two main takeaways here I want you to focus on is the COM-T and the monoamine oxidase B. Those are the main things that our drugs are going to be affecting, okay? So things we're going to find, uh, hypobradykinesia is one of the hallmark features there, that resting tremor, as I mentioned, which is usually due to too much. Acetylcholine, so good, because remember that seesaw sort of effect there. And they develop that rigidity and that postural instability, right? You get a lot of motor symptoms are going to be seen with this. And the problem, especially down the line, the more, being more progressive, they end up losing things like uh, the ability to swallow very well. They can have these aspirations. They can develop pneumonia. All kinds of problems that develop. Postural instability leads to falls, right? And they have a fall, they break a hip. Again, that leads to all kinds of problems in and of itself too, right? So again, a lot of, a lot of issues here overall. So you can also find some autonomic symptoms that can happen here. You can have both either incontinence, you can have constipation, orthostasis, sexual dysfunction, all kinds of problems there. And then there's usually a lot of mental status changes that go along with that, right? So basically overall slowing, confusion, you know, you don't know whether the dementia they're developing is just kind of natural aging or is a part of Parkinson's, hard to say. You know, depression, sleep issues are a big deal with these patients as well. So again, a lot of signs and symptoms associated with Parkinson's. And again, how do you get a definitive diagnosis? Basically off the signs and symptoms, right? There's no lab test you can do to say someone has Parkinson's. You could probably do a post-mortem sort of brain sampling and figure that out. But again, you don't want to do that when the patient's still alive, right? Not usually. So anyway, um, it can be misdiagnosed in, in several patients. But the things you're looking for, again, are those core features of hypokinesia, the resting tremor, rigidity, and the posture and stability there. Um, the other thing you can do potentially is sort of these provocative sort of tests there. So um, what I can do is if I give the patient more dopamine, and it fixes the problem that usually tells me that they have a lack of dopamine, right? So that's oftentimes what we can do is we can either give them a dose of something like levodopa, or I can give them something like a drug called apomorphine, which we'll talk about briefly later on, use as a diagnostic test. If they respond to that, similarly to something like myasthenia gravis, if you give them the tensilon test and they respond to that, it usually is a pretty good sign that that is your diagnosis there. And so our goals, we like to try to minimize that loss of functional disability, if we can try to give them their disability, you know, or try to restore some of that, that ability there, and then try to hopefully slow down the progression of disease. Now, can we completely reverse this disease state? Nope, we're not getting those neurons back, but we can hopefully try to slow it down as best we can, try to preserve those, uh, that, those neurons function as best we can. Um, and if we can, then we're gonna be supplementing uh, with uh, dopamine as we'll see in just a few minutes. So look at non-pharmacologic therapy. There's not a lot here. Um, obviously, a lot of PT, OT is going to be playing a role with these patients. Um, you know, as far as other things, you know, there could be some things like deep brain stimulation and whatnot. I'm not getting too much into that. But the pharmacologic therapy is going to be the mainstay here. So we're going to talk about both early, more uncomplicated cases. And again, the earlier you catch these patients, the better, versus late, more complicated cases of Parkinson's. 
So early therapy is going to be focused on trying to preserve as much function as we can, okay, and trying to be as economical with the dopamine that we're already producing as we can there, right? So we're going to find that for neuroprotection, this is where things like monoamine oxidase B inhibitors and dopamine agonists are going to be playing a role here. And when I say dopamine agonists, what do you think that means? I see something that directly stimulates the dopamine receptors. Even if I have a relative lack of it, if I can give them something that's going to directly stimulate it, then maybe that can help to preserve a little bit of function overall, right? Kind of give my ne uh, dopamine neurons a little bit of a rest there. Um, and then we have some symptomatic treatment here, right? So again, treating the symptoms of the disease. Uh, we have things like anticholinergics, which are going to be good for things like that resting tremor. And things like monoamine oxidase B inhibitors, COMT inhibitors, dopamine agonists, and then our dopamine precursors, which is going to be our... Levodopa, all right, so that's going to come into play here, okay? So looking at the neuroprotection, this is going to help us to try to slow down disease progression as best we can. Um, we can use things like dopamine agonist. Now, typically, what you're going to find, especially with uh, these patients who are starting to levodopa, they develop these dyskinesias after about one to three years or so. Um, even after five years, about 50% of those patients that develop that. What they find is if you're able to, instead of giving them levodopa, uh, therapy by starting off one of these dopamine agonists instead, you can actually hopefully slow that down and hopefully kind of um, kind of delay developing those dyskinesias seen with that. We'll talk about those a little bit later in the more complicated sort of Parkinson's. What we also find is with monoamine oxidase B inhibitors, by trying to inhibit that enzyme here, you reduce the metabolism of dopamine. You have more dopamine around to be functional, which is good. Um, we're also going to find this helps to decrease some free radical formation that happens there in substantia nigra. And so again, what do free radicals do? It's not just the name of my heavy metal band in high school, right? Free radicals are very reactive, right? So if, if you imagine here, looking at dopamine getting metabolized into by monoamine oxidase B, you end up developing a metabolite in H2O2, otherwise known as hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is that pretty active, chemical inactive? It's pretty active, highly reactive, right? You know, it's one of those things you pour into to wounds because you want to help to, to disinfect it, right? Because it's very highly reactive because what it ends up turning into are these reactive oxygen species. They have these single electrons that can go and then interact with proteins and denature them, which is good if in the case of bacteria that you want to get out of a wound, not great for the neurons that you can't really replace, right? So what they find is, is that by giving something that tries to slow down this process here, by inhibiting monoamine oxidase B, you have less of these free radicals being made, and thus you have less of that neurodegeneration that occurs. So this is thought to slow down the progress of the disease by trying to decrease that free radical oxygen production, and decrease uh, that damage done to the neurons over time. So that's one of the things we try to do to slow down disease progression. Now, remember where we talked about free radical generation before, maybe with like oncology? We talked about the uh, the anthracyclines. If you remember like doxorubicin and donorubicin, remember where they caused was a, a dose-limiting cardiomyopathy? Same thing is happening there. They're generating free radicals that damage the myocardial tissue. Same kind of features happening here, but it's happening to these dopaminergic neurons. Okay, kind of make sense a little bit? No, it's okay. You can go back and review the lecture later. You say, oh, yeah, it totally makes sense now. Anywho, so some of the things we can give to block monoamine oxidase B is going to be selegiline. We have rosagiline. Um, now, by inhibiting monoamine oxidase B, what sort of side effects do you think you could run into? Similar to the MAOIs we saw before, including? Hmm? You could have a risk for serotonin syndrome. Good, very good. You can read the slide, absolutely. Uh, why is that, though? Why would you have a risk for serotonin syndrome? Because monoamine oxidase B also can metabolize serotonin. So I'm inhibiting that and have a patient. We said patients with Parkinson's are at risk for depression. What if they're on an SSRI plus one of these monoamine oxidase B inhibitors? Does that sound, does that sound like a good combo? Not really, because that risk is there, right? That serotonergic toxicity can develop there. What does serotonin syndrome look like? Hyperthermia, autonomic instability, increased clonus, especially in the lower limbs, right? That, that uh, muscle rigidity, altered mental status, right? Those are the things you want to look for with serotonin syndrome, right? Um, same things can happen with these. So you got to be careful to be worried about those tyramine reactions, right? What do we say uh, foods that were high in tyramine include? Bougie. Bougie food, right? So again, all your aged meats and cheeses and your red wine, your fava beans, all that kind of good stuff. I guess I don't know if fava beans are really all that bougie. 
I don't know, probably don't hang around those, those circles to know. Um, but those are the kind of foods you want to think about, right? So uh, sauerkraut, you know, licorice and things like that. But um, beware, those are kind of the same interactions here, right? Um, interestingly enough, selegiline is actually metabolized to L-amphetamine. And so this actually can show up on a urine drug screen. This is one of those false positives that can show up. So if you ever did like a urine drug screen on grandpa and showed a positive for amphetamines, one, he could just be into amphetamines, it's possible, or that he could be have a, he could have Parkinson's and he could be on selegiline there, right? So again, you always, anytime you get a positive urine drug screen, you always want to do a really good history on the medications a patient's taking, right? You don't want to accidentally go into someone's room and say, you've been doing amphetamines, and they're like, no, I just had a head cold and I had taking Sudafed, right? You sound pretty silly at that point, but um, just be aware of those things that can happen here, right? Same sort of effects, insomnia, agitation, hallucinations can all be seen with the, you know, the non-selective monoamine oxidase inhibitors as well. The effects will be a little bit less because this is selected just for the B isoenzyme, but still the, the risk is there. Um, Resagiline can also be used. This one is not metabolized to amphetamine derivatives, so this might be a little bit better from that standpoint. You won't have to worry about those false positives there. And usually fewer ADRs because, again, this gets metabolized to an amphetamine. Amphetamines, what do you think that would do to the cardiovascular system? It's going to ramp it up, right? Tachycardia, hypertension may not be good in patients who have a history of cardiovascular disease, right? So maybe selegiline or resagiline would be a better option for those patients if you don't want that amphetamine effect around, right? Okay. So again, this is good for monotherapy or really kind of mild cases of PD. The problem though is like you're not really catching these patients very early on in a lot of cases, unless maybe they had a really high risk family history or something like that. Usually you kind of catch them a little bit later. But if you catch them early, do it uh, good for, for mild monotherapy, good for mild disease, right? Um, other things you want to be careful of, other con uh, contraindications, things you do not want to mix these with, right? Include things like, and we'll talk about uh, some of these opioids a little bit later on uh, in the pain management section. Just know that these are also going to be likely to cause um, either like norepinephrine reuptake inhibition. Um, you know, they can cause some similar effects to the SSRIs and whatnot, but uh, we'll talk about those later. But as I mentioned, you know, you want to avoid mixing this with other sympathomimetics. Things like pseudoephedra and things like ephedra, amphetamine, don't want to mix these up, right? Um, dextromethorphan, anyone remember what that was? Cough syrup. Cough syrup, right? Finding robitussin in your delsums and whatnot. Um, again, that can have some stimulant activity as well, right? Uh, so you don't want to avoid mixing those together. Uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, obviously, mertazapine, St. John's War, any of these can also have some in increased risk for developing that serotonin syndrome. And also there's some risk for some uh, anesthetics can have some bad interactions here as well. So again, just be careful, Look, make sure you're avoiding the, or reviewing the med list prior to these patients, uh, adding on any kind of new therapy to add. All right, and again, looking at the dietary restrictions, these are just foods um, that are high in tyramine that would potentially have a reaction there with the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. This is also a good table to go back and look at um, when you're reviewing the behavioral health section, right? Again, for those monoamine oxidase inhibitor reactions. Okay, um, other things you can do for symptomatic care uh, is going to include anticholinergics. This is really going to be better for patients with only the, the resting tremor, right? This is kind of their main feature, especially early on in the disease here. Um, by blocking that acetylcholine in the substantia nigra, you're going to find this is going to be able to help deal with that resting tremor. Because again, oftentimes that can be, um, you know, kind of difficult for them from a quality of life sort of standpoint, maybe make it hard for them to, you know, uh, that fine motor control to, to do their activities of daily living. So this is going to be good for patients with tremor, but with a minimal hypokinesia, right? Once the hypokinesia starts to kind of be the predominant sort of feature there, acetylcholine is not really going to be the thing you're so worried about. You really want to replace that dopamine there. Um, you want to avoid patients, uh, avoid these in patients with cognitive impairments. What do you think that is? What's one of the main sort of side effects from anticholinergics? Mad as a hatter, right? Ultra mental status. So again, if they have cognitive impairment, this is going to make that worse potentially, right? You always want to be careful giving anticholinergics to older patients, right? Um, other things you already know the side effects you can see with that, you know, the mad as a hatter, dry as a bone, or as a beat, all of that is going to be seen here, right? So constipation, dry mouth, tachycardia, uh, ultra mental status, those are all things you want to look for here, okay? Now, the ones that fall into this category, this should look pretty similar to what we saw with treatment of extrapyramidal side effects with the dopamine blockers, right? Remember we talked about treating dystonic reactions, what do you use? Anticholinergic, right? The pathophysiology is the same here. You have a lack of dopamine activity causing too much acetylcholine activity leading to those tremors, right? Affecting the, the nicotinic receptors on that skeletal muscle. So again, the same treatment is going to be effective here. We can use benzotropine, we can use trihexaphenidyl or diphenhydramine as anticholinergics. These are all going to be effective for treating that tremor there, okay? That makes sense? So the same as the treatment for EPS, those dystonias seen with our typical antipsychotics. Same treatment is going to be seen here with this resting tremor. 
Okay, other things we can use, a drug called amantadine or Symmetrol. This one has kind of an unclear sort of mechanism of action. We do know it has some NMDA receptor antagonism sort of effects. NMDA is what type of receptor? A neurotransmitter. Glutamate. Glutamate, right? So again, some excitatory sort of neurotransmitter. Probably has some anticholinergic activity. You have some amphetamine-like activity. Uh, amphetamine is one of the, their hallmark features. They actually help to stimulate release of dopamine. Right, that's why you get. That's why amphetamines can be so addictive, is because they're stimulating that reward pathway. Same thing can happen here a little bit, which could be uh, favorable for our patients because it helps to stimulate that movement again. Um, usually going to be as an adjunct. Oftentimes not used as monotherapy unless you're kind of catching uh, the disease very early on. But they can help to manage some of those levodopa-induced dyskinesias, as we'll see a little bit later on. Again, be careful patients with uh, renal impairment because they can tend to hold on to this drug and get some toxic concentrations there. Uh, and be aware of some of the side effects, including mainly the anticholinergic effects, the insomnia, anxiety. Most of that's due to the, uh, the NMDA receptor antagonism. And what you're going to find is with some of these drugs that tolerance can develop over time, and this is one of those ones, right? So it may not retain efficacy over the long run. And typically what you find for a lot of these Parkinson's patients is that you can start them on a lot of these medications early on. They'll tend to lose effectiveness over time as you lose more of those neurons. Ultimately, everyone's going to ultimately end up on levodopa, carbidopa, as we'll see in a second. Okay, uh, some other things we can do early on in disease is to, instead of maybe causing the, the neurons to release more dopamine or to you know, try to prevent the breakdown of dopamine, let's just give something to replace it entirely, right? Just go ahead and have something that stimulates those receptors. These typically get broken down into uh, ergot derivatives and then the non-ergot derivatives. You know what an ergot is? It's a type of fungus. Why are we giving our patients fungi? So basically what you find is that the ergot derivatives basically developed off of a fungus that uh, grows on rye. Anyone ever heard of the term St. Anthony's fire? Kind of this old term, but basically, uh, again, going into random tangents, but I try to use these things to try to drill some of the stuff into your memory as to why this works, and it's going to try to include you into some of the side effects. Um, back in the olden days, so think back to like medieval times, um, you know, we didn't have a, lot, a good handle on science, so most of the times if something bad happened to you, it was usually due to what? Either God or the devil, right? So one of those two things is usually happening to you. Um, so what they found was that these patients were actually ingesting this bread that, had, that was infected with uh, this fungus, this ergot fungus. They develop what they call St. Anthony's fire. They're having ultramental status. They also develop um, severe uh, hypertension, and they would get uh, basically these gangrenous limbs because you'd have this uh, uh, hypertension that would develop. The vasculature would constrict, especially on the toes and the fingers, and so they get gangrenous and which have to be amputated potentially. And so they call it St. Anthony's fire because, again, when you're closing off all that blood flow to the fingers, it feels pretty hot, it feels very painful. So what they did was they said, oh, this is obviously a religious affliction. Let's go and pray at the Church of St. Anthony. So as they went on this pilgrimage, they would get away from the infected bread. And guess what would happen to their disease state? It would get better, right? Because all of a sudden they're like, wow, I'm not eating all this infected rye. Get over to the church, they pray, and all of a sudden they'd be cured. So you can see how they can make those links in their mind there. Um, but again, so that's where we got the ergot derivatives. And this will be important when we talk about migraine treatment as well in a little bit, because these will come up again as a treatment for those, uh, for some migraines of these ergots. Anywho, though, um, what you typically find is that dopamine agonists are not going to be as effective as levodopa, carbidopa over the long run, but they can help to uh, hopefully kind of uh, delay use of levodopa for a little bit longer, maybe a few years or so. And so um, in, even in some cases, you may actually combine the two together to hopefully reduce your levodopa dose overall. But uh, what you're going to find is that you need to be careful with some of the, the side effects you can see with this, including a lot of uh, things like confusion, hallucinations, um, the orthostatic hypotension, so it can kind of make it more difficult for them to control their blood pressure. And again, it can lead them to falls and things like that. Um, you know, uh, dyskinesia is peripheral edema, so be, just be aware of the side effects associated with it. Hypertension is also another big thing you can see with that. And actually, the ergot derivatives, let's see, there's only one of these that fall into this category, um, actually can cause uh, retroperitoneal fibrosis and valve regurgitation. So that's kind of a unique sort of side effect. So again, anyone with like a valvular disorder probably want to avoid using an ergot derivative. You see the ergot growing on the rye there. If you put that into your bread, obviously you'd be ingesting the fungus at that point, and that's where it could lead to that St. Anthony's fire, as we mentioned. And so bromocryptine is one of the uh, big ones that fall into that category. Now, do you remember where we saw bromocryptine briefly before? Maybe in the behavioral talk. So remember we talked about what's the kind of the, the really dangerous thing that can develop with use of like a really high potency dopamine receptor block or like Haldol. There's serotonin syndrome for the SSRIs. What could happen with antipsychotics? 
NMS, the neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Remember that? That's that lead pipe rigidity that could develop. Well, again, if it's due to dopamine receptor blockade, what could I do to fix that? Give them a dopamine agonist. So bromocryptine is actually a drug that we could use to do that. So again, similarly to that, where you have the dopamine blockade, you want to fix it by giving more dopamine agonists. You can do the same thing here for patients who have a lack of dopamine being released. You can give them a bromocryptine as a dopamine agonist to kind of replace that. Some of the other ones you may find here include things like uh, primapexol, uh, ropinerol, and then retigotine. Uh, ropinerol you oftentimes see for things like restless leg syndrome. Uh, if you've got someone who's got like the Jimmy leg in the middle of the night, um, that can be sometimes used for that. Other things that could be useful, especially if these patients are having more cognitive sort of issues, uh, these can, uh, you know, reticotine comes as a transdermal product, which is good from a compliance sort of standpoint there, right? Um, and then something else we have called apomorphine. Oftentimes you're going to find this is better for diagnostic purposes. This is actually a direct dopamine agonist where it's a derivative of morphine, but it doesn't have any opioid uh, activity. It just works on dopamine receptors. And so by giving the sub-Q, you can actually determine if their symptoms get better, you have a pretty good idea of the patient's Parkinson's. But occasionally we'll use this as, a, as an alternative to something like levodopa, as we'll see a little bit later on. Okay, so getting into the, the meat of the drug therapy here is going to be levodopa, carbidopa. So why do I give both of these? Why not just give levodopa? Okay, well, why don't I want to just give straight dopamine? It's a good question, too. Okay, yeah, it actually ends up getting metabolized. It doesn't have a too hard a time getting across the blood brain barrier um, because we get dopamine all the time, right? What do we use dopamine for normally? Use it for blood pressure control. We use it as a vasopressor. So, you ever see someone on dopamine, usually it's to help get their blood pressure up, right? That's most often a uh, feature you see that in the ICU and the ER quite frequently. Um, but what you find is that we can't really give that um, because it's going to get metabolized. Because we have things like COMT and monoamine oxidase is going to be located peripherally, so that's not really going to be a good option there. But what we can do is give levodopa. That does cross the blood brain barrier, no problem. Um, but the problem is that peripherally, it'll get metabolized before it has a chance to really get up into the CNS. So, what can I do is to give carbidopa, and this is going to be an inhibitor of that peripheral amino acid decarboxylase. So, by giving this, this LAD uh, enzyme here, you're going to find that it will uh, inhibit the metabolism of levodopa. It doesn't cross the blood brain barrier itself, so it really doesn't have any, any kind of central acting effects there, but it allows the levodopa to act centrally and helps to reduce all the side effects. The other way that I could overcome this is by jacking up my dose of levodopa, but that's going to lead to a lot of side effects. So by giving this combination, I can just give the right amount of levodopa. It is going to cross the blood brain barrier without being impeded by that L amino acid decarboxylase and be able to turn into dopamine eventually, right? It has to get taken up into the dopaminergic neurons, eventually get converted over. That's where you can refer back to that neuron uh, diagram I had a little bit earlier. That's basically the process there. So um, the kinetics here is pretty variable. So you're going to find there's uh, several different ways we can administer this. Um, typically what you're going to find is that amino acids in the diet can compete with absorption. So if you had to tell someone on how to take this, how would you tell them? Maybe take it on an empty stomach, right? So again, if you were to take, say, a big juicy hamburger, has a lot of amino acids in it, right? It's going to be able to compete for absorption there, just like because levodopa itself is an amino acid. So by separating it from sources of uh, amino acids, it's going to help to aid absorption there, right? Um, other things you're going to find is that um, the cr blood, crossing the blood-brain barrier is also can be a saturable process here. And again, other amino acids can compete for that. So again, separating it out could be a useful feature there. Now, normally when the half-life itself is pretty short, only about an hour, but by the time you add up something like carbidopa to it, and by using something like um, a COMT inhibitor, you can extend out the, uh, the half-life here. So what you're going to find is that by uh, giving in enzyme inhibitors, as well, and we'll talk about in tacopone in a second. It's going to help our levodopa to work a little bit longer, to work more effectively, so that it can get converted into dopamine and have its activity. So um, you're going to find that levodopa, carbidopa, or cinnamet is the brain name you're going to see most often. Uh, can be used initially for Parkinson's disease, but a lot of times we like to hold off on that. We like to try to delay as long as we can because once they go on cinnamet, guess what? They're probably going to be on cinema the rest of their life, right? Because again, this is the uh, the definitive therapy as far as our concern goes. So uh, if we can try to hold off on that as best we can, it's going to be better because it's going to help the levodopa to become uh, help it to retain efficacy for longer, essentially, right? Um, as I mentioned, eventually all patients are going to require it. So again, if we can hold off on that the best we can, it's going to be better, right? So we can use a monoamine oxidase B inhibitor. If you can use something like trixfenadol for the acetylcholine activity, whatever you can, try to stave off using levodopa. That's going to be good. 
Again, very similar side effects to our dopamine agonists. So you're going to see that orthostatic hypotension, hallucinations, uh, depression, etc. Those are all things you want to be watching out for. Very similar to the dopamine agonist. Now, as I mentioned, uh, with the Cinemet, typically it's going to be in sort of a, a fixed combination here. Usually your max dose is going to be dictated by the carbidopa component here. Um, and typically you're going to be titrating up to one, look at this adverse effects you're experiencing, and then titrate to the efficacy you're looking for, right? So looking to see the happy medium between side effects and relieving some of the hypokinesia, that bradykinesia the patient's developing there. Uh, we have things like controlled release preparations, which are good too. That's going to be helpful if you have patients who maybe, you know, they take their cinnamon in the morning, but by the time they get to the evening time, the hypokinesia start to come back. Using controlled release preparations are going to be better for that because it's going to be able to give them a nice consistent level throughout the day, as you'll see. And then, uh, you know, depending on what their ability to you know, take tablets and things like that, is you have to think about the, uh, the dosage formulation, right? So again, if they're having um, dysphagia, if they're having a hard time swallowing those solid dosage forms, sometimes you have to look at either using something like an oral disintegrating tablet, something like a, a Zofran or something like that, it'll just dissolve in the mouth and they can absorb that bugally, or uh, something like a liquid preparation as well, right? And sometimes you have to place uh, lines like a, um, like an NG tube or an OG tube or something like that, just to get the drug infused into the patient uh, because they're not going to be able to swallow on their own. Right? So these are all things you have to consider. All right. So again, um, the other thing to consider, though, is we, we talked about when you have that levodopa coming into the neuron, eventually it's going to get converted over uh, into dopamine. And when you break down dopamine, we talked about that free radical generation. That's, again, why we like to hold off on L-DOPA as long as we can, because we worry about causing further uh, you know, damage to the dopaminergic neurons, generating more free radicals. And also, we're going to find that dyskinesias are pretty common with levodopa. So again, if you can hold off, it's always going to be better. So by using either dopamine agonist or monamine oxidase B inhibitor, that typically is going to help with sort of that short-term neuroprotection and hopefully delay how long um, you have before you start levodopa. Okay, uh, another class of drugs we have here is going to be the COM-T inhibitor, so that's a catecholamine O-methyltransferase. Basically, this is the enzyme that's responsible for degrading L-DOPA. Uh, if I were to inhibit this by using a drug, I can go ahead and extend the half-life of the levodopa. That may be uh, increasing the activity of the drug, so it's sticking around for longer, it's working better, um, or it means I can maybe give a smaller dose of the levodopa, or maybe it means I have to give it less frequently. These are all things that can be aided by using a COM-T inhibitor here. Um, and so typically, whenever you're adding on a COM-T inhibitor, you wanna make sure you're dropping down your levodopa dose by about 25% or so, because it's gonna be that much more effective right off the bat. You don't wanna cause a lot of side effects. And again, you want, always wanna make sure you're tapering off slowly, because you don't wanna cause a sudden lack of dopamine, it's going to lead to, you know, rebound uh, dyskinesias and things like that. And again, um, this would be a contraindicated in combination with the monomine oxidase inhibitors. You don't want to mix those two together because you're going to have too much activity. You're going to see too much risk for serotonin syndrome and things like that. So you want to be careful with that one. Okay. Um, and again, a lot of the side effects are going to be the same for levodopa because, again, it's increasing that dopamine activity. So very similar side effects you're going to see with this one. Also, again, anytime uh, you're giving something to change the color of the pee or the poop, you want to let them know. So if you see a brown or orange discoloration, what might a patient think if they had not been educated beforehand? See brown urine, you think, is that myoglobin in the urine? You think about muscle breakdown, it's usually not a good thing. If you ever think about rhabdomyolysis, you think about cola colored or tea colored urine. What about orange color? You might think, I think of blood or something like that, right? So again, pinkish orangish sort of color, like you might think something uh, like the patient's having bleeding issues. So again, educate them on that beforehand because otherwise they're going to be a little bit freaked out, I imagine. Okay, so the two we have here is going to include uh, tolcapone and then intacapone. Tolcapone doesn't get used as much because it has a uh, black box warning for hepatotoxicity, so you want to avoid that in patients uh, with liver dysfunction at baseline. Uh, but intacapone is used a little bit more commonly, and you can see this um, uh, being given. A, there's actually a three-drug combination here uh, that's uh, commercially available called uh, Steliva that actually mixes intacapone, levodopa, and carbidopa together to get a little bit better combination therapy there, right? Better activity. So the treatment algorithm, basically how you would go about managing these patients is look at their symptomatology, see what the issues are uh, initially, right? So again, if you're looking at this, if you identify you know, uh, the presence and symptoms of impairment, you know, uh, decide what you want to do. If there's no real significant impairment, you can start off with something like a monoamine oxidase B inhibitor, because that's going to help to kind of delay uh, those signs and symptoms of getting worse for at least a period of time there. If their main issue is tremor, you want to consider using something like an anticholinergic, especially if they're a little bit younger, because we mentioned what happens with anticholinergics in older patients. 
yeah, the cognitive impairment, ultra mental status, et cetera. So you don't want to necessarily use that in older patients greater than 65. Uh, so for them, you can consider something like anticholinergic such as Benzodiazepines, trihexyphenidyl, there was diphenhydramine, any of those would be totally fine from that standpoint, right? If that's still not responding to that, that's when you want to jump down to using something like uh, Cinemet here, right? Levodopa, carbidopa. Now, say for instance that the tremor and or did not have tremor, but their main issue is just that bradykinesia rigidity. Um, this is where you can start off with the dopamine agonist instead, potentially, and then eventually move on to, to Cinemet. So again, look at the, the symptoms, look and see what they're presenting with what might be the best kind of first line therapy for them. You don't always want to jump to Cinemet because again, you would like to hold off on that as long as you can in most cases, okay? Um, again, looking at the postural instability, you know, consider using things like dopamine agonists if possible. Physical therapy is gonna be playing a big role here as well. So consider, you know, both your non-farm and your pharmacologic uh, therapies there, right? And so typically what you end up finding is that early on, you're gonna start with monotherapy, right? So either using an anticholinergic, a dopamine agonist, monoamine oxide B inhibitor. Eventually you're gonna have multiple drugs together so maybe using something like, um, you know, an anticholinergic plus Cinemet or, for instance, uh, you know, Intacapone plus Cinemet. And then eventually it's going to end up with monotherapy, usually just with Cinemet by itself towards the end there, right? And again, is it ever, are we ever kind of focusing on curative sort of therapy? Not really. At the end there, it oftentimes gets more to more palliative sort of therapy, right? We're just trying to help uh, improve quality of life, you know, until the, the very end there. Because again, this is going to be a sort of lifelong sort of disease state. And we like to have them what we call the levodopa honeymoon. What do you think that means? They get hitched. They run off to Las Vegas with levodopa and say, we just got married by Elvis. No. Um, so typically what you find is that oftentimes when patients get started on levodopa, like their symptoms um, make drastic improvements, right? So again, um, we like to hold off on that because again, because it is so effective, but once you start it, they're oftentimes going to be on it for life and it's going to lose efficacy over time. Uh, so again, watch that awakenings movie and you'll get a good feel for um, the progression of disease there and how the drug works really well at first, but then ultimately it's going to end up not working at all towards the end, uh, which can be very unfortunate for those patients. But and again, if you can hold off on that levodopa honeymoon, that's typically good because it means they can just wait a little bit longer till they get it at that later stage. Okay, so what can we do for the more late sort of complicated Parkinson's disease? There's a lot of motor fluctuations that can occur with patients, uh, things like wearing off. What do you think wearing off means? Maybe the drug doesn't last all the way throughout the day. Maybe it wears off a little bit early and develop that bradykinesia towards the end of the day, right? It could be something that develops over time. Uh, sometimes we can have things like delayed onset of activity for these drugs. So they develop what we call an unpredictable on-off. We're not really sure when they're going to develop effects and when they're going to wear off for the patient there. And then with these really refractory symptoms, that's that catatonic sort of state. They get that freezing that occurs where they basically have uh, the inability to make any sort of uh, significant movements there. And then on the flip side of that, it's kind of a lack of dopamine activity. On the flip side, you can have these dyskinesias that come about from these peak phase sort of uh, activities where you have too much dopamine activity causing a dyskinesia to occur. Uh, so we'll talk about some graphs in a second that, that kind of demonstrate that. And then obviously the dysarthria and the dysphagia, these are things that can ultimately make it difficult for the patient to get nutrition, for them um, to, to eat very well, or to maintain their airway very well. Um, these are oftentimes refractory symptoms that can be very difficult to manage. This is where we have to switch over to things like levodopa oral solutions or surgery or physical therapy. These are all things that are gonna help with those more refractory sort of symptoms. So looking at this, you can see with um, early Parkinson's disease, um, you have basically this response threshold where once you get above this, that means you're going to be relieving the hypokinesia, the bradykinesia. When you get above this other threshold here, this dyskinesia threshold, that's where you can start to see some of those um, inappropriate muscle movements, the dyskinesia that come about from that. So early on, you have a pretty wide margin here. You don't have to worry about necessarily getting too high from the dopamine activity. Over time, though, you're going to find this, uh, this th threshold here is going to get lower and lower and lower. So what you find is that with really advanced Parkinson's, um, the normal dose of Cinemat may lead to you know, uh, relieving the bradykinesia, but it's going to lead to these kind of peak dose effects where you end up seeing uh, the dyskinesia that develop here, right? So what do you think we could do to mitigate that? So we could do a couple of things. We could do something like a controlled release preparation, which is going to help to um, not have such a big peak. We can maybe have something that's going to have a little bit more of a plateau sort of effect throughout the day. That could be one thing. What else could we do? maybe give smaller doses throughout the day. So maybe if you have smaller doses, getting above here and then going down, and then you give them again. You may have more of those bradykinesias, maybe you avoid some of those peak dose effects with the dyskinesias there. 
So again, these are all things you have to consider about how to manage these patients. And if you deal with these patients a lot, you'll kind of get a feel for it. Um, but again, think about how often you're giving the drug, how much of the drug you're giving, what dosage form it's going to be in, right? So uh, with the wearing off, usually this is due to the uh, loss of those presynaptic neurons there. Um, we can do things like trying to either replace the dopamine activity by giving a dopamine uh, neurogenic agonist. We could try to do things like extend the half-life of our levodopa by giving an tacopone, something like that. Or in some cases, we may just give the drug more frequently. In some cases, it gets up to six to eight times a day, which can be, what do you think it does to compliance? Makes it pretty difficult, right? Uh, you know, and again, these patients are developing cognitive impairment over time, so it may be difficult for them to think even give it to themselves. So you have to think about are that their healthcare providers or someone uh, in the home is going to be able to help give it to them. Um, you know, think about things like can they swallow well? They may need to look at those oral disintegrate tablets or the the liquid preparation things like that. Um, you know, using a, a controlled release preparation. These are all kind of tricks that we'll use in order to try to help the the kind of fudge the kinetics a little bit of the drug to help make sure that we're going to have uh, enough activity here to kind of boost up the activity of that dopamine we're trying to form there. Um, other things, actually, in some cases, some patients will uh, uh, get what we call duodenal levodopa infusions. So you basically have either like a nasal duodenal tube, or uh, it's usually the most common one, or actually you just have the infusion of the drug itself directly into the duodenum where you have most of the absorption occur there, and that helps to, to mitigate some of the um, you know, degradation of the amino acids in the GI tract. So again, there's all kinds of little ways we can get around this for those more refractory patients. For the off dystonia, um, this is where we're going to find that um, doing things like adding a bedtime dose of Cinemat. So this was um, where you can give a bedtime dose that way in the morning time. They'll still have some drug around, some drug effects. So they hopefully won't have um, too much of that bradykinesia in the morning time. Other things we can do, adding a dopamine agonist, um, you know, taking Cinemat as soon as they get up in the morning would be one thing. Uh, and we could also use something like botulinum toxin. Anyone know what that does? Well, basically, it's a, it's a long-acting paralytic of the muscle, right? So there's particular muscles that are causing significant spasticity. Um, you can give it to the patients, and that helps to relieve that muscle uh, spasms there. So we use this a lot with kids, like with CP. We also obviously use it for aesthetic purposes. Um, but again, you find a lot of off-label uses for Botox, and this is one of the ones you can use it for, right? And then uh, unpredictable on-off. So again, if you're not having very predictable kinetics, you can look at things like, well, let's look at protein redistribution. Maybe if they get all their protein in one meal out of the day and then avoid giving their cinnamon around that time, then hopefully you avoid that competition for those the sites there, right? Because can you cut out all protein out of their diet? Well, no, we know older patients are going to be developing um, they have less muscle mass overall as time goes on anyway. They probably need that protein, uh, but by redistributing a little bit, you can hopefully help to avoid them kind of fighting for the same uh, transporters there. All right, so all little things we can do to try to uh, help fudge the kinetics to make it ideal for our patients, right? And again, this is all on a very case-by-case -case basis. Okay, um, looking at the, the peak dose or the on kind of effects, oftentimes to avoid these peaks here, we can do, do things like lower the dose we're giving there. Um, if we have other drugs that are helping to potentiate the effects of levodopa, we can try to get rid of those, like these seeing a COMT inhibitor or monamine oxidase B inhibitor, something like that. Um, other cases, we may try doing things like you know, adding amantadine. Um, and in some cases, uh, and again, I'm not going to get into too deep, but even things like clozapine, which we saw as a uh, uh, you know, second generation antipsychotic and sometimes help with some of these peak effects. Propranolol has been seen to help with some of the, the musculoskeletal effects. So again, there's other things you can do there. And even more, this kind of biphasic issue that ha uh, happens here. Um, basically, you end up seeing when, uh, by shortening the dosing interval, um, they help to kind of overlap the effects of one another, uh, and that can kind of help to, to some degree. But also giving controlled release preparation is probably the easiest thing to help um, not have these big peak effects here, but instead just having a nice non-peak sort of plateau sort of uh, kinetics there. That's one way you can do it. It's the same picture here. Okay, so as far as monitoring goes for these patients, um, one, make sure that you're taking into account like when the patients are actually taking the drug because you can prescribe it and say like, okay we'll take it three times a day um but you know the question is well when should they be taking it? you know because three times a day for a patient they may be thinking well you know i'll wake up at five o'clock in the morning and i go to bed at you know six o'clock in the evening um you know maybe taking that three doses in that 12 hour period is not best for them maybe they need to be spacing out even further than that you may need to start waking up at part way through their, their sleep in order to take the drug to make sure you can consistent effect throughout the day um you know these are all things you have to consider right um you know looking at things like you know the adverse effects letting them know what adverse effects to be expected are versus what just progression of the disease is and then looking at you know reasons for non-adherence is it due to side effects is it due to cost what it was it due to um and then obviously looking for things like you know non-motor complications uh, look for things like you know uh you know 
progressive cognitive impairments, et cetera, just things you want to look for. So um, that's it for Parkinson's. Any questions so far? All right, let's take a break. We'll come back in 10 minutes and continue on. Any questions from the first half? Anyone remember what we were talking about? <laughs> mm. Yes, sir. I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, sure. Let me check the sticky board. All right, so we're talking about Alzheimer's disease here. So what is Alzheimer's disease? What is that happening here? You forgot. Very good. Is it overabundant production of dopamine? It is not overabundant uh, production of dopamine here. So actually, instead of, we're switching gears. We're going from dopamine. Now we're focusing exclusively on acetylcholine. This is the main thing we'll be focusing on here. Most of the drugs you're going to be seeing uh, working here are, are going to be working with uh, cholinergic neurons. Okay, Cholinergic neurons are really important for memory, especially in which part of the brain? The hippocampus, right? I'm glad you guys remember that, right? The hippocampus is very important for memories, uh, either developing memories or being able to re retrieve some of those memories. Um, and so what you find is, is that over time, patients with Alzheimer's end up developing these things like these um, these plaques that form. Usually this is where they have started, uh, these cells start to degrade and they develop an immune response that will kind of involve other immune cells that, that will help to cause further damage to those neurons. You also get these neurofibrillary uh, tangles that develop here as well, which can impede function of those neurons. And I'll show you a few diagrams in just a second about how uh, the neurotransmission changes and how we can affect that with our medications. So basically our goals here are trying to treat the cognitive difficulties uh, that occur with Alzheimer's, mainly things like, you know, memory impairment, um, but, you know, that can progress to the point where they are having a very difficult time performing their activities of daily living, they become incontinent, they've been uh, unable to feed themselves. Uh, so it's a very debilitating disease, especially as time goes on. And so we like to help to preserve that function for as long as we can, right? And again, there's nothing that's going to help to reverse this completely. All we can try to do is slow it down as best we can uh, and try to help them maintain as much function as they can. So uh, basically, one of the things we think, a couple of different theories for disease here, is that there's an issue with the cholinergic neurotransmission. So in Alzheimer's, we think there's a progressive loss of cholinergic neurons, similar to in Parkinson's, we said there's a, a degenerative loss of dopaminergic neurons. Here, we're losing these cholinergic neurons in the hippocampus. And by those uh, that activity declining, you're finding that loss of memory and cognition there. So if you imagine here, we have a presynaptic cholinergic neuron located right here, and then we have the postsynaptic neuron that would be uh, have the receptors for acetylcholine, right? And so basically what you find is that normally uh, acetylcholine uh, and choline are going to come together to make acetylcholine that will then be released. And then what normally metabolizes that enzyme or metabolizes acetylcholine? Acetylcholine esterase, right? There's a couple of different forms that are out there. There's uh, a few different isoenzymes. There's something called butyrylcholine uh, esterase. Um, we'll get into those in just a few minutes, but normally that'll break it down into choline. Choline can be reuptaken, and then uh, the whole process can uh, occur again, okay? Well, that's with normal uh, activity. That's where normal function is actually occurring here. Uh, what can occur over time, though, is what you find is that when you start to lose those cholinergic neurons, you have less activity actually going on here, and so fewer of those receptors will be activated, and so you end up losing that decline in function, decline in memory and cognition, et cetera, okay? Um, so what are some ways you think we can get around this? So if less neurons releasing acetylcholine, what could we do? Give more Either give more acetylcholine, that could be one thing we can uh, consider. What else can we do? Hmm? Block the enzyme. And, and actually that's the exact thing we're gonna be focusing on here is by trying to block the enzyme because we can't necessarily give more acetylcholine. It doesn't necessarily work. We don't have a good way to do that. By blocking the enzyme, we can go ahead and hopefully increase the activity of the acetylcholine that's there. There's more of it to interact in the in the that synaptic cleft, more of it to interact with those receptors. So that's more activity. Okay, so that's the main feature we're going to be shooting for. So um, typically what we're going to be shooting for with our uh, drugs that affect acetylcholine esterase is we'd like to have a good long half-life for these drugs because it means the duration of action is going to be longer. They're going to be affecting those acetylcholine neurons for, for a longer period of time, but also like them to have very high specificity. We could affect acetylcholine esterase throughout the entire body, but what sort of side effects would that lead to? What happens if you have too much acetylcholine in the body? What sort of receptors will it interact with? There's two main types of acetylcholine receptors we've discussed. Muscarinic and nicotinic. Good. What are the muscarinic effects and too much activity? The dumbbells, right? So again, again, all goes back to your to your autonomic nervous system, right? Go back to the dumbbells. The dumbbells is defecation, diarrhea, urination, meiosis, bronchorrhea, bronchospasm, bradycardia. What else? E, M is this, right? 
L's for lacrimation, and then salivation, right? You're going to be losing uh, fluids out of every single orifice, right? Um, good. What about the nicotinic effects? Anyone remember what we talked about with that? The days of the week, right? You said Monday is my dryasis, right? So again, depending on which receptors are taken over, you can see either my dryasis or meiosis, right? My dryasis, what else? Tuesday is tachycardia, right? If that's when you guys have come up here, you'd probably be tachycardic too, right? That's a nicotinic sort of effect you can see with that. Uh, Wednesday, weakness, right? When you overstimulate the, the skeletal muscle as nicotinic receptors, you get weakness. And eventually you're going to see paralysis get developed there. How about Thursday for the ladies? Hypertension, right? And then Friday is fasciculations. That again goes back with the weakness. When you overstimulate those nicotinic receptors, you see fasciculations, right? That's the nicotinic effects versus the muscarinic effects. Yes, sir. No, so when we talk about anticholinergics, and again, that's probably not as specific as we could be. When typically we're talking about anticholinergics, we're mainly talking about anti-muscarinic drugs, right? So you think about atropine, you think about uh, what are some other anticholinergics we talked about? RTCAs, talked about what else? Antipsychotics, you know, a lot of these drugs have anticholinergic activities. It would be more specific to say anti-muscarinic activities. There's really not a lot out there that has anti-nicotinic effects. Um, there are some drugs that do that. Those are paralytics, actually, and we'll talk about those uh, later on when we're talking about surgery meds and stuff like that. So anyways, you're absolutely right. Um, so just be aware that if we lack that uh, specificity and we're affecting that enzyme acetylcholinesterase all over the body, that's going to lead to those dumbbells predominant. That's the main thing you're going to see with that. Um, other things, we want to make sure that the drug's going to be able to actually cross the blood-brain barrier to actually get to the site of action. That's going to be good. Um, and again, we're actually going to find that if we could use something that was irreversible, irreversible inhibitor, that may actually be beneficial because what does that do for the duration of action? <coughs> It's going to extend it out, right? So if I'm irreversibly inhibiting that enzyme, for the life of that enzyme, it's not going to be functioning very well. Uh, and so you can find that it may actually increase the duration of action there. So um, the ones we're going to be using are going to be centrally acting. So we'd like to preferentially just affect acetylcholinesterase in the brain. So we're going to be shooting for those particular enzymes. Uh, again, the isoforms that are pre predominantly in the CNS. And then uh, typically these cholinesterase inhibitors are going to be better for treating more mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease, not more severe cases. You may try, but uh, this is better for having to kind of um, delay some of these symptoms from getting worse. Uh, it helps with memory, cognition, uh, but note here, it does not actually do anything to affect that neurodegeneration. Okay, so it does not slow down progression of disease, but it may make it so that their symptoms are less, less noticeable for a longer period of time. But those same neurons are going to degrade over time. And you're going to find that these drugs are going to lack efficacy because once that uh, those neurons are, are not firing off any of that CD colon anymore, it doesn't matter if you're affecting the enzyme, there's nothing for it to really work on, so to speak. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, Acetylcholinesterase is the predominant form we're going to find in the brain here. There's a couple of different isoforms, so our drugs are mainly going to be trying to focus on this G1 form. Uh, again, it's not specific that, that you know G1, 2, or 3, but just for our purposes, just know it's going to be good to be selective for the one that's in the brain because that will limit the systemic side effects there. There's also butyral cholinesterase, which is going to be important in some of the glial uh, cells, but not necessarily the neurons here. We're not so uh, focused on that one, but that's just another isoform that is, is available. So there's a couple of different drugs. This first one, Tacrin, we don't really use so much here because of uh, kind of, uh, you know, not really a good long duration of action, which is not great. Uh, also, it had a lot of uh, severe hepatotoxicity. This is the first one that we had, though, so just kind of for historical purposes. But um, again, we don't use this one anymore. The three that we do use include Denepazil, Rivastigmine, and then Galantamine. And you're going to see here that, uh, you know, they're all reversible inhibitors here, um, but they have di uh, different durations of action. We're going to find this one, even though it's a very short duration, we'll find there's something that we can do to get around that, as we'll see. Um, and then looking at things like, you know, hepatotoxicity, very low for these. Uh, we're going to find that the dosing frequency is pretty low, which is a good thing for Alzheimer's disease patients, because why? They're very forgetful. So, again, if they don't remember to take their drug, then it's not going to really work for them, right? So either someone else has to give it to them, or if we can give them maybe a dosage form where they don't have to think about taking their dose every single day, maybe that could be useful too, as we'll see. And then looking at the side effects, by being more specific for the isoform that's in the brain, we limit a lot of those more peripheral sort of side effects that we'll see there in a second. So looking at denepazil or Aricept, it's our first one here, again, relatively specific for acetylcholinesterase, and we're going to find there's a very long half-life, around 70 hours or so. So that means one-time daily dosing. Beneficial from a compliance sort of standpoint there, right? Again, very mild peripheral anticholinergic uh, sort of side effects, which is good because you think about, you know, what oftentimes leads, you know, it's older patients to need things like um, being put into like a nursing home. Things like them not being able to perform activities of daily living, like going to the bathroom, right? So what could 
what do we say the the u was in the dumbbells urination so this could lead them to be more incontinent right so again you want those mild sort of effects because if it was more severe that could lead to you know them getting into a nursing home that much sooner right and again what happens when you get to a nursing home yeah you you're not in your normal environment you get what did you say i didn't hear it hmm yeah, so you're not going to tell me. That's okay. Um, <laughs> you're going to see more cognitive decline. You're going to see that they will get infections with really nasty blood. It's like, it's not good. Like, you want to keep these people out of the nursing home and assisted living facilities as long as you can. Um, you know, and this is something that they were having intolerable side effects from these. Like, that's a problem, right? And again, oftentimes their memory impairment could lead them to where they can't perform their activities of daily living. That could lead them in the nursing home as well. So you want to find that uh, kind of that balance there between the two. Okay. Um, and just be aware these are metabolized by CYP2D6 uh, and 384. So you have to be careful if you're combining them with any other drug that are going to inhibit those enzymes, especially 384. That's something you want to be aware of. Uh, rivastigmine, this one has a relatively short half-life, but what you're going to find is um, that it has a very slow dissociation from the enzyme. So once it binds to the enzyme, it's actually stuck on there for quite some time, about nine hours or so. So because of that, um, you can get away with just twice daily dosing. Not as beneficial uh, from a, a you know, compliance sort of standpoint here, but something to know. Um, and then again, um, you know, that slow reversibility is going to help to provide sustained inhibition for that sort of long-term use. So again, compliance is really going to be the biggest issue with this particular uh, drug here. Then we have galantamine, um, again, very specific for the acetylcholinesterase or the butylcholinesterase. Um, this could be using um, you know, twice daily dosing as well. And again, it's going to be metabolized by 2D6 and 3A4. Um, so again, be aware of those drug interactions with that one. Really, any of these should have pretty um, pretty equal efficacy out of the bunch. Again, you may be looking at something like you know, the once daily dosing could be a really big, uh, big benefit with the nepazil, the Aricep. So a lot of times people will go with that one first line. So the, the other side, though, we're looking at loss of those cholinergic neurons. We could also look at the what's actually causing the degradation of the neurons as well. And so some people believe there is a glutamate sort of theory here, where glutamate being excitatory or inhibitory? Excitatory, right? What happens if you have too much glutamate activity? You can cause excitotoxicity, right? If you're overstimulating the neurons, it means you're going to fry them out. And so the thought here is that you have too much glutamate activity, you're going to lead to increased damage done to those neurons, and that's what leads to the degradation of, of the acetylcholine releasing neurons there in the hippocampus. So the idea would be if we can decrease glutamate activity, that can help to hopefully spare those neurons for longer. So this would hopefully be neuroprotective over the long run. Again, we don't have a lot of great evidence to show that that's actually the case, but it's a theory, right? And so what could we do to hopefully prevent excess glutamate activity? And give a glutamate antagonist, right? We've already seen several drugs that can do that already. The main one we're going to see here is memantine or nemenda. And so we can actually give this, it's an NMDA receptor antagonist, so it's blocking glutamate from interacting with that uh, receptor there. And again, it's going to be better for more moderate to severe uh, Alzheimer's disease here does help with that cognitive function, does help with them perform their daily activities, and generally it's going to be pretty well tolerated for the most part. Again, if you can imagine here, uh, the presynaptic neuron releasing glutamate here onto these neurons, um, that's going to cause increased calcium influx. Calcium can end up increasing the oxidative stress, leading to eventual cell destruction. Right? So again, by blocking this, by giving a mantine, a mantine here, you block that receptor and decrease that calcium influx and hopefully spare that neuron for a longer period of time. Right? So again, neuroprotective is the theory here over the long run. So um, typically you're going to find this is, again, good from a compliance because it's just a single daily dose for these patients here and pretty well tolerated. A little bit of dizziness, maybe a little bit of headache. Um, but again, you're not going to see any cholinergic side effects because it's really not affecting that system at all. It's really just blocking glutamate activity on those neurons itself. Any questions on Alzheimer's disease? Not a lot of stuff there. Unfortunately, it would be nice if we had better definitive therapies, but unfortunately, very uh, unfortunate sort of disease state. Any questions on that? Okay, uh, next up we have MS. We're going to talk, what is MS? Demyelination. What does that do? Yeah, it slows conduction through the neurons, right? Why do we have this demyelination? It's an autoimmune condition, right? So again, we're going to find that a lot of the drugs we're going to be seeing here uh, may have a little bit of bleed over effect with a lot of the uh, rheumatology drugs we'll see a little bit later on. Um, so again, a lot of these autoimmune conditions we're going to find are really focused on decreasing that inflammatory uh, process, as we'll see. So, anyway, as we mentioned, it's inflammatory disease of the CNS. Um, typically, we're going to find these characteristic plaques, these sclerosed areas of, of the neurons. Um, again, we're losing that myelination. And what does the myelination help us with? 
helps to speed up that conduction, right? Helps the, the active potential jump from point to point rather than having to go from every single sodium channel all the way down the neuron, right? So it's a much slower process and it's able to jump, 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 jump down to wherever the signal is going to, right? So as I mentioned, I'm not going to get fully into all this process here, but just know that there's going to be a lot of uh, inflammatory reactions happening here. The main thing we're going to be focusing on is uh, decreasing the activity, well, uh, things like T cells and whatnot, and we're going to find that this can be uh, used with things like monoclonal antibodies. We're going to find um, a lot of other drugs that are going to be very useful for decreasing this inflammation. And again, the thing you want to do early or start treatment early, because again, if you can hopefully save as many myelinated neurons as you can, that's going to help to slow down that disease progression. Anyway, um, so a couple of different uh, phases of treatment here. We're going to have the treatment for the exacerbations. Basically, they can come up with these kind of disease flare-ups here. Um, and so by treating this, and we'll find the, how we're going to be treating that, which drugs we're going to use, um, it'll help to hopefully shorten the duration, lessen the severity of the attack. Because again, um, how do, what do patients normally present with when they have these exacerbations? Anyone know? A lot of pain. It's a pretty painful sort of disease state. So a lot of them are usually showing up for, for pain issues. Um, you're also going to find that we have, for the long term, we're going to have disease-modifying therapy, or DMT. This means these are going to be things that help to alter the course of illness to, again, slow down the progression and keep them as functional as they can for a long period of time. Because, again, this can be a pretty debilitating disease uh, for these patients here. And then we'll also look at some symptomatic therapies to help maintain quality of life. Okay. So, again, obviously our goal is here to improve quality of life and main, minimize that long-term disability. So with exacerbations, typically you're going to find with a lot of these autoimmune conditions, whether it be rheumatoid arthritis or ulcerative colitis, anything like that, um, we're going to be starting off with a pretty heavy dose uh, corticosteroids. Because corticosteroids do what for us? They're anti-inflammatory, right? They're going to be decreasing the activity of the whole inflammatory system from top to bottom by working at where they work at. They work in the nucleus, right? So they change the gene transcription. They're very powerful anti-inflammatories, uh, but also means how long do they take to kick in? Takes a little bit of time, right? It's not going to be working immediately, but it takes a few hours to days before they really see full effects from these. Um, so normally when patients are presenting for these exacerbations, we can start off with IV therapy. Um, we call this kind of pulse dose therapy here. So we use something like methylprednisolone. It's a good IV formulation you could administer. And again, by doing that, it helps to decrease the inflammation, decreases the edema around the areas of demyelination, um, helps to decrease those symptoms the patient's experiencing there. Um, and again, when would you want to consider uh, using tapering dose of steroids? They're on it more than a week, right? So again, five to seven days or so, that's when you need to consider tapering off of this. So these patients, depending on how severe the exacerbation is, you may uh, need to actually consider uh, tapering them off. So typically what you'll do is just start them off on IV pulse therapy, get them kind of under control, their symptoms under control, and then switch them over to PO, and then we'll titrate them off over the course of a week or two. Um, but again, what are things you see with corticosteroids? What are common side effects? Hypertension can be worsened. What else? Hyperglycemia, right? So their sugars are going to be worse. You see weight gain, you see altered mental status, they tend to get pretty cranky when they're on corticosteroids. If they're on a really long term, what could you see? Infections could be a risk as well, right? Because again, they're going to be decreasing the immune system as well, so you have to be really careful. In some cases, you may even need things like plasma exchanges to get rid of some of those inflammatory mediators. Um, but again, that's going to be in the more severe cases. Usually, the, the uh, corticosteroids are going to be sufficient on their own. So to focus on the disease-modifying therapy, this is where we find the most new drugs we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to find that this therapy is trying to um, decrease the progression of disease over time to try to spare those neurons as best we can, try to keep that myelin on, on the uh, neuron uh, as long as you can there. And so what you also find is that a lot of these therapies are helping to decrease the number of relapses they have, to decrease the exacerbations, so that way they're going to the hospital less frequently, um, decrease a lot of those kind of the other uh, morbidities from developing there. Um, you're going to find we have uh, some older drugs, kind of the more first-line sort of therapies here, and then we have more second-generation agents, which are going to be much more effective uh, nowadays. They're actually helping to, um, even for more kind of more severe progressive sort of cases of MS. Uh, but one thing to note here, a lot of these are very, very expensive. Specialized antibodies we're going to be talking about today can be anywhere between seventy to $200,000 a year for their therapy, right? However, if it keeps them in a hospital. You know, hospitals say they're very expensive, keeps them from developing a lot of these other, um, you know, comorbid conditions are going to be uh, very debilitating, a lot of pain issues like that. Um, this may be a good deal, right? So um, initially what we had were things like interferon. Have you talked about interferons at all? We talked about them briefly during the chemo uh, section. What do interferons do? 
we don't really know. We say they're immunomodulatory. Anytime you hear the word modulate, usually we don't actually know what the heck we're talking about. We just know that it changes something. We're just not really sure. Uh, so if you want to sound smart, you say, oh, it's an immunomodulator. But, you know, you really don't know what you're talking about. That's okay, though. Um, we do know it tends to be uh, effective in some cases. But we think that it affects things like, you know, suppressor cell function, uh, maybe uh, affecting things like blood-brain barrier permeability maybe changing things like T-cell proliferation. Normally, when you're thinking about it in the case of cancer, it actually stimulates the immune system to actually tackle uh, taking out a lot of those cancerous cells. Um, we also see this being used in cases of um, uh, hepatitis C in some cases is also a drug we use for that as well. Um, but we're starting to get away from these, which is great because there's a lot of side effects associated with the interferon. Um, these are all proteins. So again, they're all gonna be very expensive. And whenever you have a protein, what route do you have to go through? Either parenteral or basically parenteral, right? So either sub Q, IM, IV, something like that. You cannot give it orally, which is going to be a problem. And in fact, that was a big problem with a lot of these drugs for a while. We didn't really have any good options that were going to be oral. We're going to see that's now changed nowadays with some of the newer ones we have here in just a few minutes. But again, very expensive, and the side effects you're going to find are going to be pretty problematic. As I mentioned, um, not great from that standpoint. Now we're giving something that kind of stimulates the immune system to some degree. So you're going to see a lot of flu-like symptoms associated with that. You know, a lot of myalgias, some, some low-grade fever, things like that. Um, Pathotoxicity is going to be an issue here. And then the other big thing is just the, the um, kind of the mood interactions that happen here. Either it can worsen depression, it can lead to suicidality in some patients. Some patients get very aggressive or angry when they're on the medications here. Um, you know, I knew one uh, lady who had, her husband was on interferon therapy for hepatitis C. And she says, oh, he's got that interferon brain going on right now. This is what they call it because um, she knew he was going to be really cranky. He's going to get into fights all the time with, with her. Uh, she knew it wasn't him. It was just the drug that was really causing this kind of increased aggression. So kind of negative from that standpoint. So some other ones we had that were kind of um, kind of first generation agents include uh, Gladimir here. Um, this is actually a polypeptide, a couple of different amino acids here. It's not important to memorize these, we just know it's a polypeptide. Um, and what this was thought to be doing was trying to mimic some of the antigenic properties of this myelin basic protein or MBP, if you see that abbreviation, that's what we're talking about. And this was thought to be one of the things that activated the T cells that kind of kicked off that inflammatory response here. So by inhibiting the actual MBP, you're able to find is able to hopefully prevent T cell activation. So you decrease the T cell function, decrease the inflammation there, and hopefully save some of those uh, that myelin there on the neurons. Um, again, it was an injectable product. So again, some negative aspects from that standpoint. Again, patients don't usually like to inject themselves with things if they don't have to. Um, and for the most part, pretty well tolerated. There are some issues though, about 10% of people end up developing it's like chest tightness, this flushing and dyspnea seen with it. Um, and again, usually lasts about 20 minutes or so and then would kind of go away. Um, again, still a very expensive drug because it is a protein. Patients have to be injecting themselves. Uh, another one here, we have uh, natalizumab. It may be on the end there, you know it's a monoclonal antibody. This one's actually specifically targeted at this thing called the very late antigen one or VLA one. And so this is another thing that would actually work on um, between the CNS vascular cell adhesion molecules as VCAM one. And these are things that actually prevented the lymphocytes. So normally when it's activated, it allows for the lymphocytes to cross that blood brain barrier and start to interact with those neurons. Well, if I prevent that interaction by targeting that VLA one, basically prevent the cells from crossing the blood brain barrier. So even though they might want to get activated, they can't get to the site of action on those uh, neurons. And again, you're saving that myelin sheath there. Okay. Um, there's a problem with this one. Actually, it's a RIMS program. Remember, it's a risk evaluation and mitigation strategies um, where, again, patients have to be signed up for, they have to be registered, providers have to be registered. There's actually a, a leukoencephalopathy that can occur here. So because of that, it's a very big risk. You have to monitor for signs and symptoms of that. And then other things include depression, fatigue, um, again, respiratory infection. Anytime we're giving anything to decrease the immune system activity, again, you do worry about infections here. So that's another thing to watch out for. So this is where things kind of make a flip and where things get a little bit better from a patient compliance and, and adherence sort of standpoint. This is uh, fengolimod. And so basically this is a the first oral disease modifying therapy for MS. This kind of changed things pretty significantly um, because again, compliance can go pretty well because the patient's just popping a pill. It's a lot easier than having to inject themselves or go into an infusion center for you know interferon therapy, things like that. And so the way this one worked is a sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor agonist. What that does is it actually will sequester these lymphocytes into lymphoid organs, to the lymph nodes and things like that, and actually prevent CNS penetration. So by sequestering them elsewhere, you prevent them from actually getting to the CNS and interacting with those neurons. Okay. So things you're going to see with this one includes uh, first dose bradycardia. So you do want to monitor patients probably in the office for the first dose, at least six hours or so to make sure they're not going to have any issues with that. And then um, you develop this lymphoma which is reversible. That makes sense, right? Because again, you're causing that sequestration of those uh, lymphoid cells there. 
And then obviously you're decreasing the immune system, so infections are going to be a big risk here. Edema, hepatotoxicity can also occur. Okay. Um, now things to consider are vaccination status for these patients when they're on these immunosuppressive therapies here. Um, we'll talk about immunizations uh, at the end of this section, uh, but basically when you have live vaccines, Typically, you want to have a pretty competent immune system uh, to deal with that, right? Because what you find is if you have someone who's immunocompromised, you give them a live vaccine, what do you think could occur? Let's say a live vaccine, basically, what does that mean? It's the, the actual virus, the actual uh, bacteria, but it's usually going to be in a weakened form, right? The problem you're going to find, and we'll talk about this later on, is that when you give it to someone who's immunocompromised, they have the potential to actually develop that disease. So even though it's a weakened form, it's kind of a wimpy form, that any one of us could probably fight off no problem, have a, comp a competent immune system, they can't do that. And so they have to run the risk of developing disease from that. So um, usually what you want to do is make sure you're giving a live vaccine beforehand for these patients, or you want to make sure you give it two months after you discontinue use, okay? So that could be an issue, um, you know, again, look at their um, immunization history, see if they're due for anything coming up, see if that's going to be a problem there. Again, what do you think could be a problem if they were on Mingolomod therapy and all of a sudden they stop therapy immediately? What do you think could happen? They have relapse of their disease, right? So all of a sudden they have rebound uh, exacerbation and end them back up in the hospital uh, because of that. So because you don't want to, uh, you have to consider kind of the timing of these things, you don't want to discontinue them all of a sudden just to give them a vaccine, look for other alternatives, right? So for instance, with the flu vaccine, you're gonna find there's multiple forms. There's forms that are inactivated, they're dead, or there's forms that are alive that we could maybe avoid for those patients given an alternative. So we'll talk about that in the immuniz uh, immunization section later. Okay, uh, some other drugs we have here that can help with MS include things like teraflunamide. Uh, this is actually inhibiting uh, this dihydroorotate uh, dehydrogenase. Basically what that does is help to inhibit this proliferation of the T in the B cells. So again, by inhibiting them, you're getting less inflammatory cells in the CNS, less activity on those myelinated neurons, right? Um, another orally available one, which is great, and you're actually going to find this is uh, structurally related to a drug called leflunamide that we're going to see used in rheumatoid arthritis a little bit later on in this class here. Um, some interactions to worry about, especially patients who have like history of AFib or maybe on warfarin, this actually increases the INR by about 25%. So it could be problematic because normally shooting for an INR what for a patient on AFib? Warfarin. Two to three, right? Shooting for two to three. If you got a 25% bump, if they're already at three to begin with, that could be problematic because then that leads them to bleed, right? You know, you don't you gotta be careful. Too high of INR, you're at risk for bleeding. So you gotta be careful. Um, so what's interesting here is this teriflunamide. Um, yes, it does have a black box warning for hepatotoxicity, so you want to monitor LFTs for that from that standpoint, which kind of makes sense why it may have an interaction with warfarin, right? Because again, warfarin is working where? In the liver to antagonize the effects of which vitamin? Vitamin K, good. Um, not potassium. Some people get that mixed up. It's vitamin K. Um, but the other interesting thing here is this teratogenicity here. It was uh, the notable thing is that actually the dr drug is detectable in the blood for up to two years after discontinuation. So it's a very, very long half-life, so we stick around for a while. And why is that a problem for MS? Who does MS primarily affect? More female than male. And again, if they are childbearing potential, they want to get pregnant, they have to consider that, right? So you have to talk to them about these things. Are you looking to get pregnant anytime soon? Um, sometimes what we can actually do is what we call this washout with cholestyramine. Anyone remember where we saw cholestyramine before? So in the hyperlipidemia section, talking about bile acid sequestrant. So this is actually kind of interesting. So the reason why this teriflunamide sticks around for so long, it undergoes this enterohepatic recirculation. Remember how we talked about that? If we give cholestyramine, it actually can bind up that teriflunamide coming out from the biliary tract and just be eliminated out to the feces. So by doing that, you can drop the levels more precipitously than waiting out two years uh, to have a kid, right? I'll advise all of you to at least wait two years before you have kids, because once you have them, guess what? They're permanent. Sticking around. Um, I'm just kidding. We had our one-year-old uh, birthday party this weekend, which I think is unnecessary because one, she had no idea what was going on, and we had a whole lot of extra work. All our family came in. They got to eat a bunch of good food and go off to Disney afterwards, and we were stuck cleaning up. So it's you know. <laughs> Or go to, go to Chuck E. Cheese or something where they do all the cleanup for you. That's, a, that's a, the realization we came to is like doing it ourselves. That's a, that's a bum deal. Don't do that. Anywho, um, other things to consider with a lot of these agents, you need to be checking uh, for specific ones, but this one you need to check for TB prior to starting therapy. What do you think that is? You have latent TB and give this drug. If your immune system was suppressing that and all of a sudden your immune system is now suppressed, guess what? 
become activated, right? So again, be careful that a lot of the, uh, the monoclonal antibodies we're going to talk about in the rheumatoid section as well, you got to check for TB beforehand because um, if it's positive, you don't want to give this drug because it could lead to activation. Okay, another one here is dimethyl fumary or uh, uh, tesfidera. Um, again, another orally available agent, which is nice. We don't really know the full mechanism, but it tends to be an anti-inflammatory. And again, some things you're going to find hepatotoxicity pretty common with a lot of these drugs here. Uh, flushing tends to be pretty common with this drug as well. Anyone remember what other drug we said was common cause flushing? Acid. Yeah, nicotinic acid or niacin. We talked about that again back in the hyperlipidemia section. Yeah, very good. Okay, uh, another monoclonal antibody here. We have alentuzumab. Again, some of these are kind of hard to say, but uh, again, just practice. Say so that way, sound really smart when you say alentuzumab. There's some of these I can't even say, though, don't worry. Um, but basically, this is actually a monoclonal antibody against CD52. So, CD52 is one of these receptors on these T cells and B cells, and by targeting that, can cause the host immune system to actually go after those cells itself, right? And also inactivate those receptors. Um, and again, it's going to be very effective at de uh, decreasing that immune system uh, reaction there against those neurons. Um, again, with this one, you're going to find there's a lot of uh, infusion reactions associated with it because, again, this is a foreign protein we're injecting into the patient there. So you're going to see a lot of uh, pyrexia, nausea, rash, headache. What do you think we could do for that beforehand? A lot of times you, we can pre-treat, especially if we know patients are going to have a reaction. So uh, for the pyrexia, what would you want to give? It's a good antipyretic. So you give them Tylenol beforehand, right? For the nausea vomiting, uh, sometimes we'll give them things like Benadryl beforehand. That helps with the, the rash and the and, uh, nausea and headache that goes along with that. So again, there, there's drugs we can pre-treat with, and that way if they do have a reaction afterwards, that's where you can go through the whole anaphylaxis you know, cascade there. Anywho, um, other things uh, you can see with this one, there's definitely a big risk for increased uh, infections like respiratory, urinary tract infections. Um, in some cases, we'll actually give them, uh, you know, prophylactic acyclovir to hopefully prevent any kind of uh, activation of herpes for patients who have HSV infections. And then TB as well is another one you want to test for beforehand, right? Um, and then uh, actually 30 to 40 percent of patients actually develop an autoimmune disease secondary to receiving this drug. So again, you can obviously tell this is not going to be first line. It's going to be kind of reserved for more refractory patients. Um, they can develop autoimmune disease against the thyroid. They can develop type 1 diabetes later on in life. They can develop glomerular nephritis, things like that. So again, uh, not a great drug from that standpoint, but def definitely things you want to be monitoring for. Okay. So anyway, so DMTs, um, patients who have poor diagnostic features here, uh, or their presentation, this is where you're going to want to focus on that DMT sort of therapy, right? So natalizumab, the fingolimide, teraflunamide, any of these are going to be good for induction therapy, right? Where you're trying to get their symptoms under control, right? That help to get it under control and then kind of go into a, more of a maintenance phase there. Um, just be aware, patients are going to respond differently to all of these drugs. You may not find that, you know, fingolimide may seem great for one patient, may not really work for the other one uh, as you go there. It gets there to the route of administration. Things like alentuzumab would have to be given via which route? You know, it's going to be an injectable, right? Usually sub-Q for the most part. Um, you know, think about things like that. So patient route is going to be really important as well. And then looking at the, the actual symptomatic management, some of these drugs we're going to talk about a little bit more um, in the, the pain management section, because a lot of them you're going to find that spasticity is a big component to this and actually causes a lot of the pain seen with MS. This is where things like muscle relaxants can play a role here. So we'll talk about baclofen, cyclobenzaprine. We'll talk about that in the, the ortho slash pain management section coming up. Uh, a little bit later on, but we've already looked at things like gabapentin and pregabalin before. You remember what type of pain we said these are good for? Yeah, neuropathic pain, right? So that's why we're seeing that here. And then, as you mentioned, Botox can be used as well for, for that spasticity. You can inject it into individual muscles to help relax them to some degree. Okay. Um, for the bladder effects, again, you find incontinence is a big issue here. We're going to talk about these, uh, especially a lot more in the urology section later on in this class, but we're going to find that uh, things like oxybutynin, solafenacin, these are good because if you had to think about the bladder, if you go back to our physiology, what are some of the things that stimulate the bladder to contract to cause voiding? Which fork of the, the uh, autonomic nervous system helped with that? Sympathetic or parasympathetic? Parasympathetic, right? Parasympathetic is rest and digest, cause you to go to, to go to the bathroom. Um, so parasympathetic, you think which receptors are affecting that? Think parasympathetic, you think which neurotransmitter? Acetylcholine, good, affecting which type of receptor? Muscarinic, muscarinic good, right? There's muscarinic receptors on the detrusor muscle that causes squeeze of that, right? It causes relaxation of those uh, those sphincters there to cause voiding to occur. So what do you think I could do to help to mitigate that, to try to hold on to urine more effectively? 
I can give anticholinergics, right? So again, going back to the opposite of dumbbells, you're going to find lack of urination. So just like here, we see that by giving something to like oxybutynin or solifenacin, these are anti-muscarinic drugs that actually help to hold them on to urine a little bit better and deal with that incontinence. You can see with MS. Okay. But again, we'll talk much more about this in the urology section later on uh, in this class. Okay. Um, other things, you know, for some of the sensory symptoms, we can use a lot of our anticonvulsants here. So things like the carbamazepine, phenytoin, TCAs may have some efficacy here as well. Um, and then for the, a lot of the fatigue that comes about from, uh, from uh, MS, as were things like amantadine, which we already saw that had some activity, and Parkinson's disease as an NMD receptor antagonist, you could use that. Um, modafinil and armodafinil. Anyone ever heard of that? It's a provigil, a new vigil. Anyone know what those are used for? Um, originally, they were used for shift work sleep disorders. So if you had someone who like worked overnights, say like in an emergency department or somewhere, and they had a lot of times uh, uh, adjusting their circadian rhythm to sleeping during the day and being up during the nighttime, those drugs are good to help kind of reset that system. Um, but now they're used off-label for things like, you know, dealing with like chronic fatigue. You may see them being used for narcolepsy. We'll talk about that more uh, when we talk about agents for sleep a little bit later on in this class as well. So again, a lot of like kind of coming attractions when uh, we talk about some of these drugs here, but just be aware. And of course, if you're really fatigued, what could you take to wake yourself back up? A bunch of speed, right? So just do some amphetamines and you should be feel ready, ready to go, right? Uh, anyway, some amphetamines can sometimes be used. So that's a lot of your ADHD meds, ethylphenidate, uh, mixed amphetamine salts, et cetera, could all be used there. Right. So any questions on MS? Fantastic. So the next thing we're going to talk about is going to be headaches. I can already see most of you probably have some as it is. So I'm going to go ahead and check the, the sticky board, see where we're at with that, and then we will come back and finish out this section and move on uh, when we come back at 2.30 today. Is everyone okay with that plan? Yeah. All right, fantastic. You get a little extra time for lunch. Everyone should appreciate that for having to listen to me for another two hours this afternoon with me. Yeah. Um, all right, let's get into headaches, something you probably all are experiencing right this very minute. Um, couple of different types we're going to talk about. We'll focus mainly on migraines is where kind of the, the most new drugs are kind of coming into play here. Um, have you talked about migraines at all yet? Headaches? Not really? Okay, well, let's, let's just be a good introduction for you. Um, so we'll talk about a couple of different types, cluster headaches, tension headaches, etc. So let's get into it. Uh, migraines being the first one. Uh, we're going to focus on why, why do we get migraines? Anyone know? Is that because we had two hour, four hours of farm today? <laughs> We had to get up this morning for eight o'clock class. So the migraines, uh, there's probably a couple of different components here. One of the big things we're going to find is this cerebral vasospasm that occurs. And typically vasodilation is one of the big things, right? So you're going to find that the vessels are going to dilate. Uh, that causes uh, pressure, which eventually leads to the migraine itself. And you kind of get this kind of, um, uh, this kind of outspreading of, of this uh, pain that kind of occurs throughout the head here, right? So these kind of electrical impulses then tend to spread. The thing we're going to focus on here, mostly for our drugs is going to be something to help with uh, that constriction of those blood vessels We try to get those squeezed back down to try to relieve that pressure. And that generally is a pretty good method in order to deal with the, the pain associated with that migraine, and hopefully have that go away. Um, what are some other things people experience along with migraines? Disorientation, what else? Aura. aura, what is an aura? They would get really mad and you power up before the big battle. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit different for every patient, but it's kind of like that, um, that, that feeling they get prior to um, migraines coming on. A lot of people who get the aura, they're like, oh, yeah, I know I'm going to have a migraine because they get that aura coming on. Uh, so you see that. What else? Along with the pain, you get the photophobia. You also get a lot of nausea vomiting, right? So that's going to be another component, too. So we can see that um, sometimes we'll need multiple uh, different drugs in order to help us out with this because we need to treat the different components here. A lot of the drugs we have for the migraines themselves are going to be vasoconstrictors, but they may not necessarily deal with, uh, for instance, the nausea and vomiting associated with that. So that's why we're going to see multiple drugs sometimes used at the same time. So typically uh, our goals here, we'd like to, you know, try to decrease the number of actual episodes they have. So very similar to other disease states, we find uh, that there are, is going to be sort of long-term sort of maintenance therapy to try to prevent occurrence from, uh, or prevent migraines from happening. And so this is going to be more kind of maintenance therapy. Not everyone's going to need that, especially if their migraines are particularly intermittent or, uh, you know, few and far in between. Uh, and then we're going to have what we call abortive therapy or therapy that's going to be good for actually dealing with the acute migraine as it happens. Remember, the drugs we use for the actual 
you know, tr termination of the actual uh, migraine itself is going to be different than what we're actually using for the maintenance therapy to try to prevent migraines from occurring. And what's actually ironic is that the a lot of the therapies that we use to try to prevent a migraine actually can cause migraine in and of themselves. So a lot of the drugs we're using, things like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, et cetera. And we'll see that when we get into the actual maintenance therapy in just a few minutes here. The other big thing to note here as well is we want to try to prevent um, medication overuse because typically what you end up finding is if you're trying to constantly treat your own migraine, especially with over-the-counter remedies like Tylenol and things like that, you can develop what we call a medication overuse headache where basically um, even though you're continuing to use more meds, like the headache's not getting any better. And in some cases, it may get a little bit worse. So again, try to limit how much meds the patient's having to take overall uh, in order to help um, you know, reduce these symptoms, reduce the number of migraines they're having, et cetera. Obviously, you know, reduce side effects, improve quality of life. That's all the things we're going to be going for as well. So, um, obviously, there's going to be non-farm therapy. Talk about some over-the-counter therapy because, um, again, when people have migraines, is the first thing they do going to be to go see you? No, a lot of times we're going to try to self-treat, right? So we'll talk about the OTC therapy, um, kind of what's effective, what's ineffective there that can uh, work for some patients. And then finally, we'll get to the actual prescriptive therapy here. So behavior therapy, um, in some patients, uh, they'll find that they have certain triggers that will set off their migraines. So some patients may need some relaxation therapy, some stress management. I'm sure all you guys could probably use both of those and large amounts right about now, right? Maybe. Um, and the other thing is like avoidance of triggers, right? So if like farm class is your trigger, maybe try to avoid that class. Sometimes you can't avoid triggers, right? So sometimes you just have to deal with it. Um, you know, getting good sleep and rest, regular exercise, all these things can try to help out and hopefully preventing more migraines from occurring or maybe decreasing severity. Hmm? As a student, yeah, except when you're a student, right? Especially when you're paying for the privilege of being stressed out and getting migraines all the time, right? Um, other things to, to note here as well, some things you may have some control over is going to be certain triggers, right? Especially like food triggers. Alcohol can do this, especially um, after like, you know, a heavy night of being like, man, we made it through our first first hard semester. Woo we're going to go have fun. Uh, yeah, sometimes you can find that the night, uh, day after, maybe uh, alcohol's not going to have a good good effect on uh, your, your, your head there. Um, things like caffeine withdrawal can be a big problem here. So again, if I told all of you to stop drinking caffeine right now, most of you are probably going to withdraw with about 10, 15 minutes or so. If I had to guess, I know I would. Um, other things like MSG, aspartame, you know, tyramine containing foods, as we talked about with our monoamine oxidase inhibitors, all that. Now it can be potential food triggers for uh, different individuals. And then other things, you know, strong smells, flickering lights, all those things can also be triggers as well. So again, if you can try to avoid those things, they're going to be triggering them. That can always be beneficial. Okay. Now, uh, as I mentioned, with our pharmacologic therapy, it can either be preventive, preventative, or it could be for the actual acute treatment of the migraine. We'll see what falls into which category is there. Um, and again, we're trying to focus based on their presenting signs and symptoms. So again, if they come in with a heavy component of nausea vomiting, we want to make sure we're using the appropriate meds to actually treat that. A lot of those meds we're going to talk about more in the GI section later on, but we'll kind of start to allude to them uh, here. And then we're also going to be looking at things like the frequency and duration and seeing what therapy is going to be best for them. So in general, um, we like to administer medications at the onset of the headache. If they have an aura beforehand, which kind of gives clues us in they're going to have a migraine, um, it can be helpful uh, to try to administer the medications and then hopefully prevent the migraine from occurring in the first place. That can be beneficial. Um, now, however, there are going to be no actual meds to deal with the aura itself. It's just one of those things we can't really do anything about specifically. Um, but again, if you can hopefully stop the migraine from occurring. It's always going to be beneficial. And then we'd like to try to limit the use of these medications uh, for no more than uh, than two week, two days per week. You're going to find some patients are going to try to self-treat, especially depending on how bad their migraines are. That's why we need things like the non-farm therapy to try to limit the total number of migraines in the first place, because you're going to find these uh, medications are not without, without their own side effects. We'd like to limit how often they actually need to use it, hopefully to prevent that uh, medication overuse headache. So, Looking at this for more mild to moderate migraines, what do you think are some things we can do over the counter? Tylenol is one that can be somewhat useful. It's kind of wimpy in the overall pantheon of analgesics, but I can certainly get some benefit out of some patients. Who would you want to avoid using Tylenol in? Patients with severe hepatic disease, right? Because we know it's going to be hepatotoxic for, for those individuals for sure. Uh, what other things can we use? Excedrin, what's an excedrin? Caffeine. caffeine. So what do, what do you think caffeine does for us as far as migraines go? Opens them or does it close them? So we said the issue with migraines is typically we're having vasodilation that's occurring causing pressure. So what could caffeine do? Constrict. Yeah, I and mean, if you think about it, caffeine does what to your blood pressure? 
she makes it go up, right? It's a stimulant. So um, caffeine can be good because it's going to help to constrict those uh, the cerebral blood vessels and try to decrease that pressure. That's one thing. What else comes in Excedrin? Aspirin. Aspirin, good. And aspirin's acting as? Hmm? A pain reliever by doing what? It's a cox inhibitor, right? It's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, right? So again, when you get that... Uh, vasodilation is occurring there again. That pressure, you're getting inflammation. So by using an anti-inflammatory, that can help to deal with that pain there. That's why we use NSAIDs a lot. So ibuprofen, aspirin. Uh, what else could be over the counter? As NSAIDs go, Aleve, right? What's the generic for Aleve? Naproxen. Yeah, those are very common over the counter medications you're going to see being used there. So Excedrin's already using caffeine. Uh, it's got aspirin in. And what else does it have in it? Acetaminophen, good. So we've got three different drugs that are all attacking a little bit different aspects of, of the problem there. You can see how those can be more synergistic when working together. Um, now, again, you want to make sure you're asking your patients, what specifically are you taking? How much are you taking? Um, so, for instance, if they're already taking Excedrin, I don't want them to take anything with a Tylenol on top of that because then you have to worry about your total daily dose, right? We'll talk more about that in pain management, but you don't want them to get too much Tylenol because then you worry about hepatotoxicity, right? So again, there's usually like a four gram daily limit for most patients out there. So you have to be careful with that. Um, typically, acetaminophen is not great on its own, but you're going to see that by using in combination, you tend to get a little bit more efficacy there. And then um, we'll talk a little bit more about this in the ortho section, but um, we have some parenteral NSAIDs that we could also use. One of the most common ones is called Ketorolac or Ketorolac, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Anyone know the brand name for that? Toradol, right? So if you ever hear Toradol, that's an IV or an IM inset that you can administer. And so again, you get better bioavailability, very fast on, that's a very good inset. In fact, we consider that to be opioid sparing. Anyone know what that means? Spares the amount of opioids you have to use, right? So maybe I don't have to use any opioids is always beneficial, or maybe I can limit the dose of opioids that I actually need to administer, okay? Um, so uh, Toradol is very good for that, for that administration, especially if you have someone who, um, you know, if they're coming in with a lot of nausea and vomiting, are they able to take oral meds very easily? Maybe not, right? So it may not be a good option for them. So that's why something like uh, Toradol is gonna be a good, good alternative because you can use that in, um, either intramuscularly or, or IV there, right? Generally, um, opioids do not have any role to play and as far as migraine treatment goes. So we're not gonna talk about that here. Um, but then getting into the nausea vomiting itself, um, you know, we have several different options that are out there. Here's just a few that we'll talk about. Certainly a lot of patients, or you guys are mostly familiar with Zofran, right? You've heard of Ondansetron or Zofran before. It's, it goes like, flows like water in most ERs, you know, people coming in nausea vomiting. Um, that one's actually gonna be, we'll talk about that more in the, the GI section, but it's actually a 5-HT3 antagonist. This is important to distinguish this from some of the other um, uh, migraine meds we're going to talk about a little bit later because they're actually working on different serotonin receptors. So here, just know we have a 5-HT3 antagonist, which is going to be our ondansetron. It's a very good anti-emetic drug. We have some other things as well, so kind of falling into that phenothiazine category, similar to the antipsychotics we talked about a couple uh, lectures ago. We have things like promethazine, which is going to be phenergan. That's nice because it has IV forms available, also has a suppository. If they're having significant uh, nausea and vomiting, can't take anything orally. Things like metoclopramide or Reglan. And then we also have things like prochlorperazine or compazine. So what do you think is going to be a big problem as far as side effects go with these phenothiazines? Based off, if you know that structurally and chemically, they're very similar to the antipsychotics we talked about, the, the typical antipsychotics. A lot of sedation associated with them, right? They have a lot of anti-muscarinic activity. Um, and so due to that, you, you, they may not be great for your patient. Like, you know, if they need, they have a migraine, but they still have to sit there eight hours of lecture. So they can become a, uh, uh, you know, a licensed PA one day to become saving people's lives. They got to sit through this lecture, right? Um, so in that case, using something that's very sedating might not be a great option with that. That's the benefit of Zofran and other 5-HT3 antagonists is that they don't have any real sedation associated with them. However, you know, if someone's like, I just, you know, I just need to take a med, do this nausea and vomiting, I'm just going to go to sleep for the weekend, Fenergan, Regulin, all of those are going to be totally fine from that standpoint, right? Also keep in mind, these do have some dopamine 2 receptor antagonism, similar to the other antipsychotics. That's also helpful from a nausea vomiting standpoint, um, but that could also lead to what sort of side effects do you think? A you know, patient who had a prescription for promethazine and they were just taking them, they're just kind of self-treating, they're oh, I'm still feeling nauseous, I'm going to take some more, take some more, take some more, what do you think could happen? That dopamine 2 receptor antagonism. Remember our EPS, our extra, extra pyramidal side effects? That can happen, right? So that's actually a big problem we saw 
uh, patients taking a really high dose reglan for something like chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting, you can actually saw Parkinson like symptoms develop because you're blocking those D2 receptors. See how it all links back together? As much as you might want to deny it, it actually does, does work itself out that way, right? Anyway, um, so those are all very good. And again, um, in and of itself, the, the abortive meds, the meds we're actually going to be using to terminate the migraine itself, tend to cause nausea vomiting as well. So this is why it's going to be beneficial if we have things on board as well that are going to be able to help with that nausea vomiting. And in fact, a big thing you're going to see with a lot of patients coming into the ERs for migraines, they're typically going to get a liter of fluids. What do you think that does for us? It just makes you feel better. Everyone feels better after a liter of fluids, right? So you get a liter of IV fluids. You typically get something for nausea vomiting like Zofran or Phenergan. And then you typically get an abortive medications we're going to see here in a few minutes, right? That's typically the typical regimen. Maybe some Toradol as well. They're probably going to inset on there uh, additionally. We'll cover these more in the GI section, but just wanted you to start thinking about these now. So for the moderate severe migraines, this is where we're going to get into our actual abortive therapy. So we're going to start off with our ergots. Remember the ergots we talked about? A scant few hours ago, we talked about causing that St. Anthony's fire, causing that severe vasoconstriction in the um, in the fingers and the toes, causing a burning sensation. That vasoconstriction is what we're using that for here. We're going to cause that cerebral vasoconstriction. Uh, actually, you know what's interesting as well is that that ergot fungus is actually kind of a, a precursor to LSD. Anyone familiar with LSD? No. No one should be shaking their heads. I don't have no idea what that is. Well, I surgically kept that. I might. I have no idea. What, or, what was that? Um, yeah. So anyway, LSD. It's a very pow powerful hallucinogen. Um, and again, please don't do drugs. But uh, just know that the ergots may be using for your migraines actually structurally somewhat related to LSD. Not to say you're going to get, you know, start to develop synesthesia whenever you get a your migraine treatment. But the, you know, there's some structural similarities there. Anyway, so the ergots um, have a couple of different varieties. We have ergotamine tartrate, which is a oral or a suppository form. Can be administered, but uh, one thing I see probably more commonly, especially in ER, is going to be dihydroergotamine or DHE. Migranol is a brand name, it either comes as a nasal spray, good for administration for patients with nausea vomiting, or it comes as a parental formulation as well as an injectable, so you can use that IV. Now, this way is going to be working, and this is going to be pretty similar for most of the abortive therapies here for migraine. It's going to be a 5 HD 1D and 1B agonist. Right, this is in contrast to Zofran, which is a 5-HT3 antagonist. This is a 1B, 1D agonist. And what that does, when you cause the serotonin receptors to activate, it's going to be vasoconstrictive. So you squeeze down on those cerebral vessels, you relieve that pressure, and starts to deal with that inflammation and that kind of spreading electrical impulses that causes all that pain, uh, photophobia, and et cetera. Right? So that's going to be very helpful from that standpoint. Um, also, sort of, there's some, some presynaptic activity as well that can also be beneficial. But the main thing we're going to see here is that on the, the vessels there, the 5-HD1B and 1D are going to be vasoconstrictive. So um, other things we're going to see here, and, and again, part of that vasodilation that occurs there is usually causes some, some pressure on the trigeminal nerve. That's what's causing a lot of the pain associated with that. So by squeezing down on that, you relieve that pressure, relieve that activation of the trigeminal nerve. Um, Nice thing about the ergots is they have a pretty long half-life, so that means you're going to have delayed recurrence of migraine. So it's not like you get a dose of it in the ER, you go home, and then you develop another migraine within six hours. The big thing here is you want to prevent recurrence, is that can be very good from that standpoint. However, a lot of side effects associated with the ergots, which is why they're not used quite as often as they used to be, but they still get used with some regularity. Um, one thing, you're going to see vasoconstriction elsewhere than just in the uh, CNS. So you're going to see some hypertension that can develop. So this might not be a good option for patients who are already hypertensive. See chest tightness associated with that. And you can develop this peripheral ischemia. It's that ergotism that we talked about. That was that St. Anthony's fire phenomenon we mentioned. So you can get these cold, numb, and painful extremities, paresthesias. And in some cases, you can induce things like MI. So patients are, uh, you know, cardiovascular disease already can have an MI be induced here. You can cause bowel ischemia. Brain ischemia can occur with too high of a dose or maybe too uh, too much repeated dosing there. Uh, it can cause gangrenous extremities. So again, these are things to be, you know, not usually a big deal if you just have a one-time dose for a migraine every once in a while. But again, if they're uh, self-treating, they're using that nasal spray consistently, um, more often than they should, this is where you can run into these problems here. Okay. So um, contraindications, again, if they have any history of coronary vascular disease, you should avoid this. If they're hypertensive and they're not well controlled, you know, they come in and they're and again, when you're in a lot of pain due to a migraine, what do you think your blood pressure is going to do anyway? Elevated. Probably ele elevated anyway, right? So again, they may be elevated above baseline, but if they come in and they're like 180 over 100, this probably isn't the best drug for them. They probably need something else to get that um, 
or by getting the pressure down and dealing with that pain from the migraine itself. Um, another big thing here, this is going to be category X as far as pregnancy goes. Now, we haven't talked a lot about pregnancy categories so far. We'll talk about it more in ob gyn but if you had to guess, what do you think X means? Get some superpowers. So you may have like a Wolverine baby coming out and then, no, I'm just kidding. It's very bad. It's going to cause teratogenic effects, probably end up uh, constricting all those little vessels that the baby needs for circulation and the baby's probably not going to make it. So again, this is going to be absolutely avoided. And so if you think about it, who's more likely to develop migraines, men or women? Typically women, right? So again, if you have a young lady coming in of childbearing potential, what might you want to check before you give them an ergot? Possibly a pregnancy test, right? Or at least get some confirmation on them that they're on oral contraceptives or, um, you know, they can tell you all day long, there's no way I'm pregnant. Does it still happen sometimes? Absolutely, right? So again, um, you know, if it's your license on the line, I'd probably go ahead and just double check a UCG anyway, just to make sure, right? Anyway, um, Another big thing to note here as well, you do not want to use these within 24 hours of a triptan. Triptans are going to be the shorthand term for the, um, the medication we're going to talk about next. They're now sort of the gold standard for migraine treatment. Um, you do not want to use these within this time frame because they're both going to be vasoconstrictive. If you cause too much vasoconstriction in the CNS, what can happen? Cause an ischemic stroke. If you have too much vasoconstriction on the coronary vessels, Cause an MI, definitely the bowels can cause ischemia there and infarction. So again, you want to be careful not mix and match these meds. Um, that's why getting a good history is important. So they come into the ER, then they have a migraine. The question you want to ask them is, what have you tried so far? Have they just tried some ibuprofen at home? Have they did they try an ergot or a triptan at home? And now you got to figure out something else to give them. Those are things you want to know because you don't want to mix and match these drugs. The vasoconstriction is going to be too much. These are not over the counter. These are all going to be prescription based. So basically, the only thing over the counter the patients can get access to is going to be acetaminophen, caffeine, ibuprofen, and naproxen. Basically, yeah, everything else is going to be prescription at this point. Good, uh, good question. So, um, so ergots were used for a good long time. They've been around forever, um, but now the the newer class of drugs, and again, relatively speaking, new, um, is going to be the triptans. These are also going to be 5-HT one B and one D agonist. You're going to be a little bit more specific to those vessels there. So you're not going to see nearly the same degree of hypertension. Um, you don't necessarily get the same um, category X sort of warnings from a pregnancy standpoint as these. Uh, a little bit more specific for just these serotonin receptors. And so um, one of the first ones we had here was uh, sumatriptan or imitrex. I'm sure most people probably heard sumatriptan or imitrex before. This one is really great because uh, it has several different uh doses forms are available out there so you can have nasal forms uh you can have subcutaneous oral a lot of different options here the only problem with the oral routes is bioavailability is pretty poor so again that's why you usually see the nasal spray getting used a little bit more frequently there um other things include zolmatriptan risotriptan narrotriptan if you see triptan you're pretty well sure what type of drug it's going to be um, based off of the name there right um we'll find there's a little bit of difference in the activity of these as we'll see forward uh moving forward and differences in the bioavailability, which is what these percentages are here. We see there's differences in the half-life amongst them. Typically, we like long or short half-lives for this sort of thing. Long is good, right? Because, again, we don't want recurrence of those migraines. So we're going to see some, some benefits and in, in, um, deficiencies of these meds as we go forward. We'll talk about that briefly. And, again, oftentimes what can lead you to choose one or the other is, one, what has the patient already tried? What have they responded well to? So I have someone who comes in and they said, you know, oh yeah, I tried Imitrex before and it just didn't work for me. Am I going to try Imitrex again? Probably not, right? And again, the patient's not going to be too appreciative of that because I already know it doesn't work for me. And also, you know, you don't want you want to make sure the first thing you try is going to be most likely to be successful. So, um, so we'll get into the details on these. So, as I mentioned, these are going to be vasoconstrictive, um, very similar in activity to the the ergots as far as actual therapeutic efficacy goes here. Um, and again, typically these are very, very effective. Probably about 85% of patients tend to be uh, effective with the first dose here. Um, depending on the half-life, you can then see some common recurrence, which is kind of a uh, downside to some of these that have a shorter half-life. So for instance, like Imitrex is about a 40% recurrence within the same day, which is not great, which is why we like some of the longer acting ones, things like Frovastriptan and, um, and Emerge there. So side effects you're gonna see with these, and again, this is gonna be more so with the, especially the parental formulations, they're getting like, you know, really, big dose, very high bioavailability, immediately you're going to see some chest symptoms like tightness, pressure, pain associated with that. Tends to be pretty self-limited for the most part, should go away with a little bit of time. And you can also see some things like some uh, you know, stenia, paresthesia, things like that. But again, these should be reversible. It should be pretty much uh, self-limited there. Again, these should be contraindicated in patients who have coronary artery disease, 
previous MI, angina, because again, based on the vasoconstriction, you know, it's going to make that worse potentially. Um, Want to avoid this with monoamine oxidase inhibitors? What do you think that is? Serotonin syndrome. Not necessarily serotonin syndrome, but if you think close, right? Serotonin toxicity, I would say, right? So again, you're absolutely on the right spectrum there because these are affecting serotonin receptors. If I have other drugs on board, they're increasing serotonin levels. You can see those receptors also being hit there. And so you can see kind of excessive vasoconstriction, right? So it could be a sign of serotonin toxicity, not necessarily serotonin syndrome in and of itself, right? But absolutely, uh, you're correct from that standpoint. And again, do not use this within 24 hours of the ergots. I see way too much vasoconstriction. Okay. Um, so how do we choose a tryptan? Usually sumatriptan is probably one of the good uh, ones to start out with as a gold standard. It's pretty cheap at this point. So there's a lot of generic formulations that are out there. Um, and just be aware that, you know, a lot of people do get relief within 15 minutes or so, but for some, it takes a little bit longer. So maybe within an hour uh, to get full efficacy from the sub-Q form, a little bit longer for the intranasal or the PO forms. And again, that makes sense based off of how the drug is being administered. Um, you know, sub-Q is going to be able to get into the systemic circulation a little bit faster than the other routes there. And as I mentioned, recurrence can be somewhat common. So, you know, if they say, you know, hey, you know, it works great for a little bit for a couple hours, and it comes right back, sumatriptan may not be a good drug for them. Other ones, uh, kind of our second generation agents, tend to have decreased recurrence, increased bioavailability, um, and hopefully decrease some of the side effects like the chest tightness associated with that. Um, mainly because they're going to either have greater receptor potency, so they're going to have a better time getting into those receptors and activating them, uh, increased lipophilicity, so they can get across the CNS and the blood brain barrier a little easier, um, and they just have better bioavailability and half life. So looking at something like zolmatriptan or zomig, um, either comes as an oral disintegrating tablet. Why is that beneficial? So they're nauseous. They don't, have to they don't want to swallow anything necessarily, right? So if it dissolves in their mouth, if you look at Zofran, like I mentioned, it's a very common antiemetic. That comes as an oral disintegrating tablet. It's the most common form you're going to run into. And that's because if you're nauseous, you don't want to swallow anything necessarily. It might trigger off another uh, round of emesis there, right? Um, most of these tend to have pretty similar efficacy to sumatriptan. So there's not anyone that is absolutely way more effective than the others necessarily. But the benefit here is a longer half-life, better bioavailability, et cetera. Um, however, the onset's a little bit slower. So you may have to wait four hours or so before you really get full efficacy. So there's always kind of a uh, risk-benefit analysis you have to kind of see with that one. You have risotriptan or Maxol. Again, comes as an ODT. Um, this one's interesting because there's actually a drug interaction when you give this with propranolol. And we're going to see, like, you were like, why, why would you ever get those two together? You'll actually see the propranolol can be used as a, uh, a preventative sort of medication that may take uh, every single day. And so what's interesting is you actually find a 70% increase in AUC. Basically, just means a lot, a lot more drug exposure uh, for the patient there. And so because of that, you couldn't end up developing that toxicity, that chest tightness, et cetera. Um, so in that case, you actually want to decrease uh, the doses they're going to be receiving with that. It's kind of an interesting interaction there. Uh, we have almatriptan. Uh, this one's unique because it's going to be metabolized by CYP3A4 and monoamine oxidase. So if you had any kind of interactions there, they're, say, on phenylzine for depression that could interact with that. Um, you know, if they had any kind of CYP3A4 inhibitors on board, that'd be something to note there. Um, see, allotriptan also metabolized by CYP3A4. So anyway, so you can kind of see uh, the big thing with Frovo right here is it has the longest half-life out of the bunch. So if you had someone who really had a lot of recurrence of migraines, this is probably going to be the best drug for them from that standpoint. All right, so as far as the acute treatment goes, again, um, figure out what they've already responded to before, figure out what they've not responded all that too well to before. You know, if they're coming in, they're like, yeah, I already tried to dose uh, ibuprofen, you know, full therapeutic dose, and it didn't really do anything for me. That's when you want to consider using one of these triptans here. Um, typically, if you can get it on early, so for instance, the patient has an aura, and they know when the migraine's coming up, try using the oral form. It's probably going to be fine. It'll kick in by the time the actual migraine starts to kick in. Um, then we can use non-oral routes. If we can't catch it early, or if they have like uh, significant nausea, vomiting, that'd be another case where something like you know an intranasal form, uh, the ODT, or using uh, like a subcutaneous form is going to be beneficial there. And typically, give about an hour or so for the sub-Q to fully work. About two hours in intranasal and the PO forms. Now, as I mentioned, do not use a triptan within 24 hours of an ergot or another triptan. Due to that prolonged vasospasm, you're going to see with that. Uh, and then we really try to avoid using it more than two days per week. 
for abortive therapy, right? So again, if the patient's having more than that, we probably need to look at some sort of preventative therapy, either find the trigger that is causing them to have so many migraines or give them some sort of preventative medication to try to limit the number of episodes they're having there. Because again, the more often you're using this, the more vasoconstriction you can see, um, the more likely you are to see those overuse headaches that can develop. So again, try to limit no more than twice per week. And again, always go with the stepwise approach here. Um, looking at the, the number of you know, incidents that they're having per week, you know, you can determine whether you really need to look at using preventative therapy, which we're going to get into in just a second here. Um, and then looking at kind of the, the symptomatology here, if it's more mild to moderate, start with the easy stuff, right? You know, no point, in, you know, shooting for the moon here. If you don't need to, acetaminophen, NSAIDs, aspirin, caffeine, any of those are totally fine to try out first. If they're not responding to that, that's when you can want to try uh, using combination therapy. And if it's still inadequate, that's when either ergots or triptans are going to be good. Um, just remember, Really be, think about the pregnant patient or the pregnancy status for patients. Um, you know, if you're ever considering using an ergot uh, because of that risk there, it's a category X. So again, no good use for that drug. Um, you know how early we start checking for, for pregnancy, like in our computer system? How many years of age? Younger than that. Nine, actually so, uh, as young as nine. And again, that can be set differently at every hospital, but it just goes to show you like it can happen, right? And that's why you want to be screening for these things. Even if it's a nine-year-old and you can't ask the question, right? You never know what their status is or what their um, personal history is, their social status, whatever the case may be, right? Anyway, um, again, they're still not really responding. So when you kind of dig a little bit deeper, look and see, you know, what kind of preventive therapy we're using. Um, you know, oftentimes you do not want to mix triptans or ergots, never mix those two together. Um, try to really maximize the dose of the triptan or the DHE that they're on. Okay, uh, so getting into the medication overuse headache. Again, this is where you're going to find um, where they're overusing the ergots or the triptans, even opioids in some cases. Um, when they're having headaches greater than two, uh, or equal to 15 days per month, so even every other day here, um, and if they're using ergots, triptans, or opioids greater than 10 days per month, that's kind of the general feel for it. I'm not going to ask you specifically, is this medication overuse headache or not? I'll, I'll tell you specifically, but just so you can kind of get an idea for the frequency here, here that they're using these medications, um, typically what you're going to find is they get this hyperalgesia that develops. You know what hyperalgesia means? basically increased pain, even though they're taking these analgesics uh, for their pain, they end up finding they get kind of hypersensitive to that pain there when they're overusing these meds here. And typically the best thing to do for these patients is to try to kind of figure out what the underlying issue is, um, you know, if it's a particular trigger or what the case may be, and try to wean them off their medications uh, slowly, right? You don't want to cut them off cold turkey because then they oftentimes have a lot of rebound headaches associated with that. So again, try to wean them off uh, over the course of several weeks or so, even uh, several months in some cases here. As I mentioned, um, you know, if they're taking maybe less than 7 to 12 analgesic tabs or capsules per day. This is where you're going to be looking at uh, discontinuing the analgesics. In some cases, patients may be okay abruptly discontinuing it because you're kind of using the wimpier side of medications anyway, um, or maybe even over four to six weeks or so. And this is where we're going to start prophylaxis meds. We'll talk about what that is in just a few minutes here. If they're even greater than that, um, say 12, you know, they're taking a bunch of Tylenol, ibuprofen, triptans every single day like this is where you want to uh, make sure you do not want to abruptly discontinue because they are again are more likely to have one of those with rebound headaches so who is a candidate for preventative therapy well this is where they have you know recurring frequent migraines if it's interfering with their daily routines like they can't make it through their lectures because they get so sick and nauseous or their heads pounding too hard and they can't even pay attention in class whatever the case may be um or if they maybe are a bad candidate for um, you know, the acute treatments, right? So again, if they have a history of uncontrolled hypertension or um, MI or something like that, where these abortive meds are not really going to be good for them, this is where preventative therapy can be useful. Other things, you know, looking at the cost, you know, if they can't really afford the cost of it, they just, uh, you know, preference comes into this play. So a lot of different reasons why someone may be a good candidate for preventative therapy. So um, first line, but this is going to be our beta blockers. Now, if you imagine what a beta blocker is going to do as far as they're going to vasoconstrict or vasodilate, I think beta blockers are typically used for hypertension, right? Good. So you'd think they're used for hypertension. They probably cause vasodilation overall, right? Okay, that makes sense. Um, so what do you think that could do as far as migraines go? It could worsen it, right? So you're like, well, wait a second. This seems counterintuitive. Why would I give a vasodilator to treat a condition that's primarily due to vasodilation? The thing here is we're trying to sort of reset kind of what the normal is, right? So hopefully prevent that 
rapid dilation from occurring by kind of giving that beta blocker and hopefully trying to, um, you know, kind of give the, the, the cerebral vessels kind of a new normal, kind of prevents having those wild swings between dilation and constriction, kind of sets it at a nice medium there. However, you must know that when giving, if you were to say give full dose beta blockers right off the bat, you will induce a uh, migraine, right? Because of that vasodilation is going to occur there. So you want to start very slow and tie trade right up gently to see how they're going to respond to it, right? Other things we can see by either by blocking the vasodilation also can maybe help uh, inhibit uh, serotonin release from platelets, which you can see uh, cause some issues there as well. Um, and again, think about what's going to be best here. So ideally, this is working up in the CNS, well, what kind of beta blockers? Maybe hydrophilic, lipophilic, Probably more lipophilic beta blockers, right? So something like propranolol probably has the most evidence for use behind it. And again, if you remember, that's a really good fat soluble sort of beta blocker. But who might that not be good for? Yeah, asthmatics, who else? The elderly as well. Remember, we talked about that causing uh, hallucinations and nightmares for those elderly patients. That's not a good option either uh, for some of them. So think about that. But other ones could certainly work. Atenolol, um, metoprolol, any of those would be totally fine. Think about that, though, about your patient, where the comorbid conditions they have, et cetera. Um, so again, that tends to be good. Start low, go slow with those drugs, right? Other things that are getting uh, a lot of good use as well are going to be some of our anticonvulsants, right? Again, anticonvulsants have a lot of uh, off the label sort of use, whether it be for bipolar disorder, uh, whether it be for treatment resistant depression, whatever the case may be. But here we see anticonvulsants can be good as preventatives for migraines. So either we have uh, valproic acid, these are thought to work by sort of inhibiting that, that spreading wave of depression that occurs when the migraine triggers. So that kind of makes sense how that can work from a neurologic standpoint because we know that's doing things like blocking those calcium channels and you know, working to help enhance GABA, things like that with valproic acid. And then another one uh, commonly used is going to be topiramate or topamax. Remember that one had a lot of off-label uses. Sometimes we'll use it for... Um, you know, weight loss in some cases, which is good because that's a decreased appetite, which could be good for some patients, maybe not for others, especially if they're underweight. Um, this one is thought to, you know, have a host of different features when blocking glutamate, uh, blocking calcium channels, sodium channels, etc. Um, so overall, you're getting less trigeminal nerve activation, which again is what leads a lot to that spreading wave of depression and pain associated with that. And so quickly, we're starting to see Topamax becoming more of a first-line agent. It's also good because if you have a patient who's got cardiovascular risk or um, not a good candidate for a beta blocker, Topamax or valproic acid is probably going to be a good option for them. Other ones, um, we see that uh, tricyclics may have some utility here. Probably amitriptyline has the most, uh, you know, utility associated with it so far that we've seen in studies. Uh, in some cases, we find that SSRIs may be somewhat useful. Some patients may actually have worsened migraines associated with that. So again, these are just different options you can try. Um, you'll probably start with a beta blocker or topamax first and kind of work my way down from there. Um, if they were not a good option for, or a good candidate for beta blockers, calcium channel blockers could also be used. Um, we see probably the most uh, activity with verapamil, which is a non-DHP or DHP. Or is a non-dihydropyridine, right? <laughs> verapamil and platizum was the other one. Good. So they have also been shown to decrease frequency, have, uh, you know, they have minimal effect on the severity. Um, some people have a little bit better time with it. They have a history of auras associated with their migraines for whatever reason. Um, and we've seen some mild effect with nifedipine, which is what type of calcium channel blocker? Oh, it would be a DHP. So again, just different options you can try. Um, you're going to find here that you know we kind of have less and less evidence as time goes, or as uh, we get down to some of these you know third fourth line sort of agents here. Um, in some cases, botulinum toxin can actually be used here as well. This is probably the third time we've talked about Botox. How do you think this might work for migraines? Do you inject it right into the brain? <laughs> hmm? Yeah, so basically, if you imagine a lot of tension headaches tend to be due to a lot of the neck muscle pulling, kind of straining back on, on the back of the head there. And so, again, this can contribute to those migraines. And so if you have patients who have that spasticity as one of those muscles, you can end up um, uh, injecting Botox into those muscles and kind of relax that somewhat and deal with those tension headaches, that, uh, maybe, you know, kind of precursors to uh, the migraines themselves, right? So, again, a lot of different options that are out there. Uh, I'm sure if you talk to a neurologist, they'd be like, oh, yeah, this is my favorite one for this type of patient. I like to do this for this type of patient. These are the kind of general considerations here. Right. So again, if I gave you an option on a test and I said, you know, you got this asthmatic patient uh, who's coming in uh, with a history of hepatic disease, you know, you say, okay, well, I don't want to use propranolol, I don't want to use valproic acid, maybe Topamax is a good option for them, or maybe Verapamil is a good option for them. These are things you want to kind of think through, right? 
Okay, as I mentioned, start low and go slow. A lot of these can actually induce migraines in and of themselves, uh, themselves, especially the beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, um, and give it uh, several months to really evaluate how effective they're gonna be. If you need to stop therapy, you wanna taper down because otherwise you can't see rebound headaches associated with that. Okay. And we should consider pretty successful because you're not gonna eliminate probably all migraines, but you know, if you have about a 50% decrease in, in recurrence, I would say it's probably considered to be pretty successful from that standpoint. So again, um, the goal would be nice if we could get down to zero migraines, but it may not always be possible. So try, make sure you're kind of educating the patient to be like, you know, what is a success versus what's a failure here, right? Okay. Um, again, this is kind of a good table to kind of show you what could be good preventative sort of options here, kind of the way to work through it. So for instance, you know, if they have comorbid depression or insomnia, maybe TCA is a really good option for those patients. Or they have a comorbid seizure disorder, maybe an anticonvulsant like VPA is gonna be a good option. So these are kind of good, um, you know, cases where you may think, okay, well, this drug is better than this drug because of the comorbid condition, right? So it's a good test question I could be asking as well, right? Okay, um, looking at migraines in women specifically, we see there is a higher prevalence, we've kind of already alluded to. Um, clinical considerations to consider is, you know, um, kind of where are they at as far as the hormonal cycle goes, because you know the estrogen can play a big role as far as um, either enhancing or, or helping with migraines as we'll see. Um, now, as far as oral contraceptives go, we'll talk about this in ob later on, um, but uh, oral contraceptives usually help or hurt migraines. You're right, it could be both, right? So again, they could either help them or they may actually make them worse depending on the patient, right? So you may find um, some people get some benefit out of this and may have decreased recurrence on migraines while they're on oral contraceptives. Some people feel that it actually gets worse. A lot of that can depend on the dose they're receiving. Some of it can go into the progestin that they're receiving. Uh, typically you're gonna find that they're on a pretty set estrogen for most of the oral contraceptives, but the progestin changes pretty greatly. You can find a lot of different varieties thereof. And again, we'll talk about that more later, um, but just know there's some different considerations to make here. And again, think about with pregnancy, if you have migraines during pregnancy, that's a big consideration too, right? Because again, ideally, how many medications should a pregnant patient be receiving? Like a multivitamin, like that would be nice, but you know, we, we're going to find that it's not always going to be, you know, uh, the, uh, possible with all, all patients. And well, again, we'll talk about that more in ob a little bit later as well. In the menopause, what's happening there? Have a relative lack of estrogen, right? Because again, they're not producing any more of their own. Perfect. So um, again, look at this as far as when you're looking at menstrual migraines. Um, again, the attacks are pretty predictable, right? And again, it has to do with the estrogen decreases that play a role in those uh, menstruation-related headaches there. And so again, if you know it's going to be happening about this time of the month, every single month, um, then you start to maybe take preventative medications around that time. So sometimes that can be useful uh, when it has that kind of predictive, uh, predictable role there. You know, so either uh, using like an NSAID, an estrogen, or tryptan, maybe two to three days before the onset, and then continue for five to seven days, hopefully should carry them through that period and be able to kind of manage them through that, right? So again, by supplying either extra estrogen and giving them that tryptan or the NSAID, whatever the case may be, treating them through that should hopefully get them through without having any migraines at all, hopefully. That would be ideal. Uh, as I mentioned with oral contraceptives, you may find that it's going to worsen it, may help it depending on the case here. Um, what you can find options when oral contraceptives cause or increase migraines. What could you do in those cases? Well, um, either try a different formulation or maybe try a different dose of the um, estrogen progestin they're receiving there. In some cases, we may only use a progestin only pill. So we'll talk about those again later on OB-GYN, how uh, some of the drawbacks associated with those. Um, in some cases, we, we can either try to discontinue the oral contraceptive or we can actually decrease the number of estrogen withdrawals. Because normally, if you were taking oral contraceptives, how many estrogen withdrawals do you have in a month? Well, that would be how many ever days, right? So you get about one week, right? So you get one week uh, straight because normally if you look at an oral contraceptive packet, and guys, you've never seen one before, we'll educate you on this on the ob guidance section later on, but typically about 21 days or so of active drug therapy, and then there's typically seven days worth of placebo pills. The placebo pills does what for us? Basically kicks off menstruation, right? It basically is going to be simulating what the normal menstrual cycle would be like for a female patient. However, um, does a woman have to have 12 periods every single year? No, not necessarily. You can actually get them consistent drug therapy throughout the year. In some cases, you can only have one period a year. You can have four periods a year. Uh, I know this sounds like black magic, but it actually works. And we'll talk more about that later. But um, just know that by decreasing the number of withdrawals they have, may it be able to help with that. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I died? Oh, no. That's not good. Does that mean I have to keep giving the lecture if I died? Hold on one second. Pause it. 
Um, so anyway, as we mentioned, uh, the, by decreasing the number of estrogen withdrawals, that can sometimes help with the migraines. Um, even something like vitamin B6 can help in some cases. So a lot of different options, and we'll talk about this more ob later on. Okay, in pregnancy, typically the drug of choice is going to be acetaminophen. This is the most, um, has the most track record as far as safety goes, um, especially when uh, looking at developing fetuses. Um, opioids, not a great option because you do worry about physical dependence, you worry about other issues, so we like to avoid opioids if possible. Um, triptans, category C, does anyone know what C means? We'll cover this later on, but like an A, A you imagine is probably pretty good or bad. Pretty good, as like no evidence of uh, damage to the fetus, either in human studies, animal studies. What do you think of B is? Now, most of you overachievers probably think a B is terrible, but no, B is actually pretty good too, right? If you can get a B rating on a drug, that's actually that's pretty good. Um, C is kind of the, um, you guys know that drawer you have at home or maybe at your parents' house where like all the old electronics go to and all the kind of, just a dump drawer, everything miscellaneous gets thrown into that same drawer. That's C for, for drugs, right? Everything for like, well, we don't really know what it does. Maybe it, maybe it help, you know, harms the fetus, maybe it doesn't, it just goes into that category. So C is not super useful. However, D, you imagine it's probably pretty Bad, if I had to guess. If you got a D on a test, you feel pretty bad, right? And X would be even worse. We don't give X's around here, but if you can imagine if you got an X on a test, you did really, really bad. So, um, same thing goes for the drugs here, right? So, a C is going to be one of those things where it's kind of like we don't really know what it does. Not a lot of good evidence. Because, again, can you do good studies in pregnant patients? We're going to take 100 pregnant women, we're going to have 50, 50 of them, uh, this drug, and 50 of them, no drug. Not very ethical, right? So we can't do that. So that's why a lot of the times we're just going off of anecdotal sort of case reports and things like that. Anywho, um, but the NSAIDs, not great, especially going towards a third trimester. I'll talk about that later, but you'd like to avoid that if possible. It turns into a D during a third trimester. And then ergotamines are category X throughout. So you do not want to administer those at all. And then um, possibly we can try some preventative meds, as we'll see. Um, maybe somewhat useful, depending on the drug in the, in the woman. Okay, uh, real briefly about tension headaches. Um, typically, these are going to respond pretty well to over-the-counter uh, analgesics like NSAIDs, acetaminophen, Excedrin, which you mentioned that co combination of aspirin, caffeine, and Tylenol. In some cases, you may see uh, some people being uh, using acetaminophen or aspirin, so it's either one of those two mixed with caffeine and the butalbital. Have ever heard of butalbital before? Maybe you heard of Fioracet or Fioranol. It's a pretty common medication a lot of people will get prescribed. Butalbital is actually a barbiturate. You remember any other barbiturates we talked about? Phenobarbital, what else? There's pentobarbital is the other one we kind of mentioned here. So, um, and this is kind of a little trick. If you ever see someone who, and actually barbiturates is one of the things they test for on a standard urine drug screen. If you ever have someone who comes up positive for barbs, barbiturate, not Dr. Austin's, but um, <laughs> barbiturates, if you ever go, and you see that, the first question you ask the patient is, hey, do you take anything for migraines or headaches? They probably say, oh yeah, I take Fioracet. Uh, because Butalbital, a lot of people don't recognize that as a barbiturate, that will show positive on those urine drug screens. It's very rare you find people nowadays that are actually abusing phenobarb or abusing pentobarb or anything like that. It's just not really in vogue nowadays. Most of the time it's more opioids or benzos or something like that. So just a little tip. Um, however, we do see a lot of people end up kind of overusing uh, these medications here, if you're set, you're not quite frequently, and they tend to get that medication overuse headache that develops. Um, and then when they end up running out of their pills, they get the rebound headaches, makes it even worse, and kind of becomes this kind of sick cycle there. First, preventatives go for tension headaches. Um, pretty similar to what we saw with, um, uh, with actual migraines, but like you know, the TCAs, SSRIs tend to be a little bit effective here. Um, and oftentimes you'll see tension headaches associated with smoking. Smoke cessation can be really beneficial there as well. Um, if you had someone who you wanted to help quit smoking and maybe you want to put them on a medication, on an antidepressant, what could be a good one? Zyban. Zyban or bupropion, right? It could be a good option there, right? So um, that could have some efficacy, kind of pulling double duty from that standpoint. Okay, and then finally, cluster headaches. These are very severe, severe headaches. These actually do respond fairly well to ergotamines. Um, so either ergotamine or DHE can use these. Um, triptans have some pretty good efficacy as well. And then uh, those cluster headaches actually sometimes can respond well to oxygen. So basically putting the patient on a non-rebreather can sometimes help to deal with some of those symptoms as well. But typically these abortive therapies are going to be recommended for them. And then prophylactics uh, for cluster headaches. Most patients do respond pretty well to verapamil as a prophylactic. Um, some people have responded to lithium in the past. 
Um, but again, you have to be careful of the side effects and the monitoring parameters. You want to watch for that. Um, and then some patients have responded well to ergotamines um, and corticosteroids, but either of those are not good options for long-term therapy just due to the side effects, which we have already talked about with ergotamine uh, and the corticosteroids, you know, is a problem because of hyperglycemia and infection risk, et cetera. So it's no good. So any questions on headaches? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Probably not a best way. It's probably kind of a, um, you know, weigh the risk versus benefits sort of thing there. So if you can, um, you know, look at why they're having that pain in the first place. You know, so for instance, if it's chronic knee pain, like, can they are they a good candidate for maybe a knee replacement, right? That could help to limit the number of analgesics they need to take from, from that standpoint. Um, you know, typically you wouldn't necessarily see medication overuse headaches for someone who's taking, say, an insect for chronic knee pain, if they don't have a headache disorder on top of that, but certainly if they had both, that's where you can run into some issues there. Um, I would just make sure not to, um, you know, discontinue the insect abruptly, because that can lead to rebound headaches from the, from the headache standpoint. Um, but yeah, you may need to look at some of the preventative therapies from the headache standpoint to see if maybe that'll help somewhat. Um, yeah, but that would be a tough, tough situation to deal with. Especially when you think about it, because like someone who's managing osteoarthritis may not be the same person who's a specialist at managing headaches, right? You know, you're talking about neurology versus, you know, say someone's like a ortho person or something like that. You know, so sometimes that can be troublesome when you have different specialties or all kind of managing different aspects of the patient care. And guess who's kind of the center of it all? You as a, the family practitioner, right? Assuming uh, that you as a primary it could be tough because again, if you say Dr. X started this drug and Dr. Y started this drug, but you know they're antagonistic to one another, are you going to be the one that DC it? You should be, right? Exactly. You should have the courage to say, I'm going to take the patient's best interest at heart and maybe communicate with the other specialists. But hey, you know, Dr. So and so is doing this, this person's doing this. What can we come to as a compromise? Because a lot of times you in the middle, you just want to say, Well, I don't want to touch their other stuff, so I'm just going to let it go. And then that's where we run into problems, drug interactions, um, antagonistic medications, therapeutic duplications, et cetera. Right. So be courageous, have those difficult conversations and be like, hey, what should we do for this patient? Because you've got to have their interest at heart. Anyway, any other questions so far? Yes, sir. Well, you said under the anticonvulsants that it inhibits early wave spreading of depression. So when you have uh, that cerebral vaso dilation that occurs. You're putting pressure on the trigeminal nerve that can act, uh, activate and cause this kind of spreading wave of depression. And that's part of the, the pathophys of, of developing those migraines itself. By giving something that's going to increase the threshold for having the actual depolarization occur, something like an anticonvulsant like VPA, um, that's going to help to kind of prevent the spread of it, just like you would see the preventing the spread of an, uh, you know, a seizure, um, kind of working the same method there, basically. Anything else? All right, let's do a 10-minute break. We'll come back and then start on our HIV lecture.